Is it two o'clock? Did I get it on time? Is this going to be a miracle Saturday? I hope so. So this week's live stream is about to start and we're gonna be talking about buying corals online because a lot of people do that. These lights are too bright. They're making my, my forehead blow up. What am I supposed to do? All right, well, let me just make sure you guys are all coming in, I hope. And uh, once we have some faces, there's one. Hello, Claudius, how are you? Always nice to hear from a few faces and know that some people are tuning in. We are starting our live stream on time. I'm sure everyone's gonna wait until eight minutes after to even check. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna try to adjust this light a little bit more. See if that helps. Uh, it's a little bit better. Maybe I can do this one too. Ah, better. I don't look blown. Uh, it still hates me. What is the deal? That's just a forehead. Cooperate. All right, guys. Hey, everyone. All right. So I just got back from Aquashella. This is a shirt I got. Thought it was pretty cool. And uh, I had a great time. It was last weekend. We had about, um, well, you know, I don't know how many people attended, but let's just assume it was between five and 6,000 people. So it was a really busy event, a lot of people there, a lot of vendors, and there was actually a room I never even got into in two days' time, and it was full of all kinds of uh, reptiles and stuff, so of course I didn't go into that room. <laughs> I had a really nice time, though, seeing a lot of my saltwater friends, seeing new products that were being released that were leaked on Instagram. And I also was able to kind of incognito check out the freshwater section. So you guys will see that in an upcoming video. I shared it on Facebook for some giggles, but uh, I had this idea and it was funny. So that should be coming up soon. Actually, this whole week I was like, I really want to get the Aquashella video out. So of course my week didn't go as planned, it didn't happen. I'm kind of hoping I can wrap up this live stream today and sit down and edit that one and get it out to you guys. I also, while I was in Chicago, visited the Shedd Aquarium, and that was my first time there. And I had a great time, and I even got to go behind the scenes with one of their, their marine biologists or curators, and he told me, you can't film anything back here. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, because you guys want to see what makes them tick. We care. And yet, this happens almost every aquarium I go to, we cannot show you what's happening behind the door, and, you know, online. And basically it's because of the PETA groups and you know the animal rights groups. They just want to use that in a negative spin where actually it's fascinating all the equipment that's used to keep livestock healthy and alive for a long time versus throw them in a glass box and watch them die, which is what PETA likes to say, or groups like them. So anyway, I, uh, I had a great time and I, I can't share anything from behind. Uh, annoying, but uh, I do have some stuff from the front, and I think you guys will enjoy that. I know, I know. Brian says, you're a minute early today. <laughs> I was actually in, in this spot um, before we even uh, got started, but I thought, I can't start five minutes early. The world will come to an end. So I, I was right at two o'clock. All right, so that was, okay, let me show you the new stuff from Aquashella. I have to move something because I can't see my list. All right, so I got a bag from Flipper. And I got some stuff in it. So we're going to start off with the first thing. The first thing I got, weird, I got two of them. It's kind of awesome. I don't, don't know how that happened. This is the brand new smaller magnifying uh, viewer that Flipper makes that holds onto your tank with a magnet. This one is uh, designed for a 20 gallon tank or smaller, which is great. Uh, it's going to have a magnet that can't handle the width of the bigger tanks. So this one says it can handle up to 3 8 inch glass. So that's what that's brand new. It's coming to market. It will be on my website soon. I'm like, what's on my arm? What's on my arm? <laughs> so here's the actual magnifier. And this is the little magnet. This guy here will go inside your tank. And this will be on the outside. And you'll just put it where you want. And you'll look at your stuff. You can see the algae better. So, I know I freaked out my fish. All right, so that's something new. Um, and that will be on the site soon for you guys with your smaller tanks. This is a prototype, but I'm sure it's gonna become a real thing. So, <laughs> this is how they gave it to me. And what this is, is a little tiny cleaning magnet for smaller tanks. So you would just put them together and scrub your glass. You can flip it over and use the other side with this side 
which has teeth to kind of like scrape through the coralline. So that's kind of neat. And apparently this part here where the teeth is going to be replaceable as it wears down and gets less sharp. So that's something new. I don't know what it's going to cost or anything. It's just uh, something I get to play with. Me and magnets. All right. And then the most important share of the event was their new uh, filter. So hey, everyone has a cell phone and I'm always telling you guys use a filter. Flipper came out with a new one. Look, it comes in a nice pretty case. You can hang it off your keychain. And what they have done is they have made a small disc. There's two in here. Okay. So you've got... Ah! I glued it to my table. Okay, so you got this guy here and you're going to glue it in the back of your phone. Really don't want to glue it to my phone, but I'm just going to push it on for now. All right, so now it's on the phone. <laughs> and then you're going to take your clip, crinkle, crinkle. Sorry, guys. And you will <laughs> see, I didn't glue it to my phone good, thank God. I didn't really want to glue it. I want to I want to buy a cheap case to put this thing on so when I want to use it, I can. But then it would hold on the back of your phone. It's going to be hard to demonstrate since it keeps moving. But the way this thing works, this thing will be on the back of your phone. And then this right here will be your lens that will fold over and cover the eye so it just folds. You can also remove the filter entirely. And now you have a ring. And so if this was on the back of your phone holding on, you could actually have a way to put your finger through there and hold your phone a little bit more stable, you know, so you wouldn't drop it. And additionally, they're suggesting that once it's on the back of your phone, you now have a little tripod so you can set it down on a table and it'll stay in place. I know it's a hard way to demonstrate it, but uh, there you go. So that's kind of the way you can do it. And then when it's folded over, it's just another solid object in the back of your phone where you can hold it to keep your phone in place. Uh, I thought it was pretty neat. So I got one to play with. And like I said, I'm going to find like a $10 case and then I'm going to give it a try and see what she does. But uh, that's kind of cool. And it's because this piece of metal is so thin, it will not affect your, uh, you know, like wireless charging. It shouldn't be a factor at all. So that is a brand new toy that they're coming out with. And I have to play with it some more. So I want to show that to you guys. All right, my phone is still good. I need to turn off all these notifications because people are blowing up my phone. All right, I think that'll work. All righty, so uh, let's see. USMC Reefer, it was great to meet you at Macna too. I don't know what you look like, but I bet it was a great conversation for 13 seconds. Um, let's see, <laughs> some people know about my incognito. All right, uh, so let's talk about buying corals. Uh, this is actually a really important topic. And because I don't sell corals, I can pretty much say whatever I like. And, uh, but really, you know, I'm not a negative person. I'm going to emphasize the importance of thinking ahead and being wise in your purchases so that you're happy and you avoid some of the common pitfalls when it comes to buying corals. Because some of you will tell me, hey, Mark, I've never, uh, I'm not near a fish store. I'm, it, you know, I'm so many hours away. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I have no choice. This is my only option. And one of our moderators in Club Milo's Reef, he actually uh, buys all his corals online and they're delivered right to his front door. And uh, he keeps showing pictures of beautiful things he's bought. So it is possible to do it. But, so here's the thing. Whenever I want to look for corals myself, I typically don't buy them online. It's very rare if I do. Uh, I don't even... I bet I haven't done it five times in the last 21 years. You know, I tend to buy my corals in person. I like to go to the store and say, oh my God, I want that. How much is it? And if it's something I can afford, I buy it. Um, when I'm in someone's home, if they have frags they're selling or giving away and they offer me something or I can get it from them, you know, I will do that. I really like to get things in person and I really like to get them the same day. So if I buy it, that means within a few hours it'll have been put through a dip and then it goes into my reef. And I feel like that is why my approach has worked so well for me. But if you are a person that has to buy corals online, I wanted to warn you of some of the things that can happen, which can be extremely frustrating and you might even, uh, you know, it could be a complete turnoff. And okay, so how do we start this? First of all, I recommend reputable sellers. Um, a reputable seller has a real website. 
you know, just like Milo's Reef is a real website you can go to to buy things. Um, I'm going to throw out some names just uh, randomly. Unique Corals is reputable. Live Aquaria, reputable. Uh, Tidal Gardens, reputable. Uh, and that's just a few. I'm just off the top of my head. I mean, there's probably 15 more I could suggest. But there's a whole bunch I would never suggest. And anyone, and, uh, I'm just going to, uh, here we go. I'm going down the rabbit hole on a small rant. I really, really cannot stand the Facebook sellers. And if they don't have a real website to back their business, I hate it. Because I feel like you're just meeting a guy in an alley, and he opens his coat and says, which one do you want? You know what I mean? It just seems so... Ugh. And, you know, they're... Of course, most of them are going to say, hey, I'm helping people save money. I'm giving them a better deal. Which I don't necessarily think is the case. There are some things that are very expensive in this hobby that... I feel are unscrupulous sellers. Uh, there's some scrupulous sellers doing it too. <laughs> but it's just a concern. I hate it. And when I see people say, this person ripped me off and it was two years ago and they said they were in a motorcycle accident and I was understanding and I got ripped off and I'm owed hundreds of dollars and they never re you know, repeated the order. Or here's another example. I'm just giving random things I come across. I see them every single day. I bought this thing, this fish or coral, probably coral, and it took three days to arrive. Three days? Really? Why would you ship livestock priority mail? It must be shipped overnight. So let's talk about shipping. Whenever you buy corals or fish or invertebrates or cleanup crews, you know, whatever you're getting, you need to buy it where it ships overnight. Anything else you're doing is a risk. Is it possible to make it work? Yes but the risk goes up exponentially. So the quicker you get that order, the better. I never, ever, ever recommend receiving an order on Friday or Saturday, because if anything goes wrong, it won't be delivered, delivered until Monday or even Tuesday, which is like three or four days, because it sits in a box in a hot warehouse or in a frozen warehouse, depending on the time of the year. And the livestock is just dying in a bag that has less and less and less oxygen and more and more and more ammonia. So. Avoid the last day of the week. Avoid Saturday. You know, don't even do it. I, if you work at a real job, I would have it delivered to your real job. Um, if you can't do that, and they're using, I'm going to give you FedEx because that's only I ship with. I ship FedEx. So if you can, from the seller, you know, the company selling the corals, if you can have them ship it to the closest FedEx Kinko's location by you, you can pick up your order at 9 a.m. in the morning. And... So let's say you have to work all day. But if you said, hey, I got to come in an hour late, <laughs> or two, then uh, you could uh, go ahead and get your livestock, acclimate it really quick, dip it, and get it into your system, and then off to work you go. But if you can't do that, at the very least, you can pick up your box, and you can go to work and put it under your desk if you have one, and it'll be in a, in a climate-controlled environment. It's not in the back of a truck bouncing around, getting really hot all day long and you uh, have a better chance for success. And as soon as you can break away, lunch break, or your shift is over, you can go deal with your corals. And they will do so much better than them sitting on your front step at three in the afternoon in full sunlight <laughs> until you finally get home at five or 5.30 and you pick up that hot box and you come inside and you open it up and you're like, oh, how, how bad is it? You know, we don't want that. We want good. We don't want how bad is it. So try to order things that will deliver midweek Preferably anything you buy online should ship at 6 p.m. that night and be on your in your area at 9 a.m. the next day, which could be the FedEx Kinkos. And if you're doing delivery straight to your door because you don't want to go to Kinkos, then uh, you know you might get it at 3 in the afternoon, but still it's from 6 p.m. to 3 in the afternoon. That's still only uh, 21 hours. So better. But stuff that goes for three days, I've had people say, hey Mark, can you send me some of your macroalgae? And, you know, they want me to ship it priority mail. And I'm just, you know, it's 100 degrees here. I'm like, no, I'm not putting that stuff in a bag, in a box, priority mail, and hoping this stuff survives in 100 degree weather for the next two or three days so you finally get it. I just don't do it. And I point people to a website that sells corals, uh, sells uh, plants, like live-plants.com. They sell macroalgae. And there's a couple more in Florida. Uh, also, when you're going to these websites, like the one I just mentioned, take a look and see if it says HTTPS. If it says that and your browser is secure, this is going to be, again, a reputable vendor. Now, can a, a ripoff agent get a secure certificate? Yes, they can. 
it costs money. But most of those guys are just trying to get make a quick buck and they're not trying to keep you secure. They're not trying, they're trying to move corals. They're trying to make a bunch of money. You know, they just, they're, I hate them. <laughs> it's the truth. I can't stand it. Ah. So I'm wanting you to buy from people you can trust. I'm wanting you to ask other people, hey, I'm thinking about buying from this person. Have you heard anything? I want you to research the person you're buying from. And if the person says, oh yeah, you can just send me money via PayPal or Venmo or Zelle or whatever it is, that's already a flag, but not, not completely bad. But it's worse when they say, can you send it friends and family so there's no fees? Because now they are actually breaking the rules of, for example, PayPal. And you're not allowed to do that. Friends and family is for friends and family. This guy's not your friend and he's not your family. He's selling you corals and he's trying to not pay 3% on the transaction. 3% is nothing, okay? I'm sorry. I've been paying 3% on my PayPal account for every single uh, order that comes to my website for since I started selling things online. And I've never thought about it twice. I mean, I don't like it, but I pay it because that is how you run a business. And the, so I have a website. I have the secure certificate on there and I run every transaction through PayPal. I, uh, if you cannot, you know, like buy something off my website, I send an invoice to the customer, which is kept in records. You know, I pay taxes on the income that comes in. I mean, there's a lot going on and it's completely above board. And when you're buying corals from someone, I want to be above board. So if there's anyone out there that's running a Facebook business without a website, I encourage them, if they're watching or they're hearing what I have to say, that they do that. Set up a website. Put some pictures on there. Now here, let's talk about another thing that happens when you're buying corals online. You see this fantastic thing. You're like, oh my god, that is fantastic. I don't care what it costs, I'll buy it. And then you get it and it's brown. You're like, that's not what I saw. See, that's another risk because you're buying something sight unseen. You saw a picture. It was made to look the best it possibly could online and you fell in love with it and you bought it. <laughs> and that's kind of a, uh, a risk. What you could do, you could take your brand new coral that you just bought and you could put on your aquashella glasses and then it'll look closer to what you had. <laughs> but no, seriously, sometimes they tweak the photos a little bit more unrealistically to make the sale and you're not gonna get that incredible gem you're hoping for. Secondarily, you're, the picture you're getting is of the coral from above, which is every coral looks best from above, but then you plant it in your tank and you're looking at it from the side, it's not gonna look as pretty. So are you gonna climb back on top of your tank and look down and say, oh, it is so pretty, I'm very happy. There's a chance you're not gonna be happy with what you got. There's a chance you won't even get what you ordered. You might get something completely different or a frag of that, and what you saw was like the best piece, but they gave you a different piece. These things can happen. And then, you know, people feel like they've been ripped off and they feel like they uh, should get a refund or, or that the vendor should make it right. And, you know, really, it's a risk. I mean, you're taking a chance. It's like buying things at the frag swap and then being upset. Now, I'm <laughs> when I say frag swap, I don't mean a club frag swap. I mean, like, literally going to a frag swap like the city does and they're selling electronics and they're selling toy cars and they're selling blankets and God knows what. And you go there and you buy it and you're hoping it'll work out and then you get home and you open the box and stuff's wrong and you're like, oh, because you didn't buy it at Sears or Dillard's or uh, Home Depot or, or Best Buy. You know, you went and tried to get a better deal. So I kind of feel like uh, vendors, I mean, guys selling, that's a, that's a more specific term, guys selling, not an actual vendor. Uh, guys selling are have moved their Craigslist business onto Facebook and there are some really bad apples out there. So I'm warning you to help protect you. And I hope that this resonates with you guys because it's really important. Um, speaking of the, uh, the sales on Facebook, this is another thing that I've been watching happen for the past, mm, I'd say about six months. And a lot of people were selling things through the Facebook groups. Uh, I run Club Mila's Reef. I'm an admin in Saltwater Aquarium and Reef Keepers, which is S-A-R-K. And in those groups, we don't allow sales. And there are other groups that are literally buy and sell groups, which apparently Facebook has no problem with. But our groups do not. And people will try continuously to skirt the rules. They'll post a picture of a coral and they'll just write something like PM me. Or they'll put a question mark. 
or, you know, it's just like, I didn't say it's for sale. There was this one guy that put up an ad recently inside the group that he wasn't allowed to do this in. And he said, I'm selling my entire setup. You're getting this huge tank, sump, all this stuff. And uh, there's going to be livestock, but I'm giving that to you for free. And you can take care of it for the next 18 years before I pick it up from you. See, he was just trying to skirt the rules. He was trying to get away with it. But the thing is, Facebook is watching everything. And they have algorithms that just basically automatically flag stuff. And groups that are not allowed to sell livestock, at this time include saltwater groups, can actually be shut down by people selling in them. And so the moderators and the admins are deleting stuff left and right and posting, do not sell in this group. And people keep acting like they can do it anyway. And you can't. Go do it where you're allowed to do it. Make a website, use Craigslist, use eBay, go to frag swaps and set up a little table and sell your corals. Quit trying to take advantage of people or break the rules. It's even worse. Not only are they taking advantage of people, but they're breaking the rules too. I mean, it's a double whammy. So it is, it's really been bothering me. And so this is kind of a rant, I guess. I don't know. I, I just wanted you guys to be protected because, you know, you guys tune in every week. You know, like four to 6,000 people watch these live streams typically. And... If I can help protect four to 6,000 people, <laughs> I'm happy with that. And if this video were to go further and I can help even more, that's great. We definitely want to focus on companies that have been around a good long time that take good care of people. Oh, I just thought of another one I like, Cherry Corals. And they actually have a fish store now. They started off as an online business and they expanded into a store. And this coral right here that you can't see, well, yeah, you can. <laughs> Uh, that coral right there was the most expensive coral I ever bought from Cherry Corals. It was the first coral I ever bought from Cherry Corals. And I bought it at Aquashella, Dallas, um, last year or earlier this year, earlier this year. And uh, when I walked up, I was wearing those orange glasses and I was like, oh my God, that coral, I have to have it. And Todd Cherry is the owner of the company. And he's like, wait, you're going to buy a coral from me? <laughs> he said, stop the presses. Mark Levinson is going to buy a coral from me. And I, I bought it, and it was a lot of money. And it's still alive, thank God. But, uh, yeah, it's a really pretty ACAM. Um, you guys have seen it. I'm not going to worry about sharing it to you. Uh, let's see. Oh, and finally, you know, I sort of started with this. Uh, when it comes to getting corals, your best bet is to go to frag swaps. And I'm talking about coral frag swaps. And uh, if you can see that there's one in your general area, if it's three hours away, five hours away, it's still worth the trip. You drive five hours, you spend an hour and a half or so shopping, you buy yourself four, eight, 12 corals, you know, that you were just like, you couldn't live without, and you drive all the way back home, and you still got it home quicker than if you'd shipped it overnight. <laughs> Plus, you picked it out in person, you knew exactly what you're getting, and who knows, you may have even had a little bit on the pricing to kind of save some money. I really do like buying corals at Frag Swaps, and that's pretty much been my standard for some time now. Um, and so if, and of course, anyone can buy a coral in a local fish store. So going to the LFS is an important thing because it supports their business, which supports our economy, which supports our hobby. So you have a store to go to when there's a problem. So I understand the desire to buy things online. I understand the fact that things can be cheaper online, but there's a huge risk which the store has already taken, their stuff is being shipped overnight to them. They're going to the airport in the middle of the night and picking up all these boxes of livestock. They rush up to their store, they deal with all the acclimations, they dip everything, they set it all up in their tanks, and then they finally get a little bit of sleep, and then the next day open doors and hope you'll show up to buy things. So they have assumed the risk. Uh, they received the DOAs. Oh, that's another thing I wanna talk about. They received the DOAs, they set them aside, that was a loss and then they keep what's still alive and hope to sell it to you so that you can enjoy it and grow it out into something major. Now, DOAs, that's an important one. When you buy things online, please know what the vendor expects of you if there's a problem. If FedEx just messes up and they don't bring you your package, they say they delivered it, and you're like, there's nothing on my front doorstep, that's a whole other thing. That's no one's fault but FedEx. And at that point, you gotta track it down. And when you do that, a lot of time is being lost, you're freaking out, you know these things are alive, you know, you're yelling at them, they don't care. <laughs> it's, it's really kind of a, a round robin there for a little bit. But once you finally get uh, that box to you and you open it, there may be some things dead inside. So you need to do exactly what the vendor said you should do immediately. Like if you received an order, you open the box and there's a dead, I don't know, let's say zoanthid. You pick it up, the water's brown, 
the thing is just, you know, melting off the frag plug, odds are you're supposed to take a picture and send it within two hours of receiving the box. That might be their rule. If you don't, if you write them the next day and said, hey, I just want to let you know I got my order yesterday and nine out of ten things were great, but one thing died, uh, I just want to let you know, they may not care. They may say, no, nope, you didn't let us know in time. It's very important for you to uh, let us know instantly if you want us to honor our warranty, which, you know, every company will handle their warranties differently. So find out what you're supposed to do. Read their shipping information carefully on their website. See what all the, the rules are. See what days they ship and don't ship. You know, they might say, we never ship on Friday, you know, for a Friday delivery. It might even be on the website. And, uh, and... This also works for cleanup crew companies. Uh, Reef Cleaners is famous for their, their uh, cleanup crew critters. And that company uh, ships out livestock to people across the nation all the time. And someone recently posted in, in uh, Milo's, uh, Club Milo's Reef. I oh, should stick that on the website. I mean, stick it on the screen for you guys. So he uh, posted the pictures and he goes, Oh, everything's dead. I'm so upset. And two things crossed my mind that were not related to the company. <laughs> the first thing was, did you acclimate them your own way and not do whatever they said you should do for acclimation? That was the first thing that crossed my mind. And then the second thing was, uh, was he even interpreting the situation correctly? Or was it he was set in his ways and saw, um, saw something he wasn't used to? Uh, like, for example, he said specifically, the bags full of snails had no water in them which there's a lot of dry shipping out there where they just have a little bit of moisture, maybe a wet paper towel, and that's it. And the snails are retracted into their shells, and then they will only come out when they get back in water. That's a completely normal way of shipping stuff overnight and save money for you. Shipping is very expensive. Very. I mean, it can be 80 bucks for overnight shipping. A lot of companies seem to be able to do it between $35 and $45. And I've actually asked a couple of vendors, how are you getting this pricing? And they said, we don't. We pay a lot in shipping. I was like, oh, so you're putting some of that into the livestock? I'm like, yes. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. So when you see a vendor that says, hey, I'm selling six, no, six corals. I can't do six on, on the camera. When you're buying six corals online for $250 um, and free shipping, they may be planning to only make $180 because they had to buy the box. They had to cool it. They had to pack it. And uh, you know, they're going to send it to you but maybe it's more like you bought five corals and you got one for free, so to speak, because it was covered by the shipping. That could be a technique. Um, so it's just good to know these things. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure that this, uh, the situation this person encountered, I'm sure Reef Cleaners worked with him and resolved it, but I didn't see a follow-up. So I do want to recommend you guys be very careful. And uh, I think it's better to be careful and spend money once than be ripped off. And if you do get repped off, you will never forget it. <laughs> and then you'll be thinking about this video saying, ah, oh, I should have listened. So did I leave anything off? Nope, that was everything I wanted to talk about about that. So um, look at that. I covered it really quick in the first 30 minutes. Not bad. I'm seeing a few thumbs down. I don't know what I said that offended some of you, but that's okay. Maybe you're a coral vendor that sells on Facebook and you're mad at me now. That's okay. I don't buy your corals. I know that was a cheap shot. I was kidding. Um, let's see. I'm going to go through here really quick. I do want to mention that the next... <laughs> Another thumbs down. <laughs> uh, the next Aquashella uh, is going to happen in Dallas, and I think it's in the spring, so in about six months. And so if you are considering coming to one of these events, it's a lot of fun. It's half saltwater, half freshwater. There's a whole bunch of crazy art. Um, a lot of things you can buy, and there is um, uh, there's music, there's black lights, there's a lot of blue lights, um, but the freshwater environment is all daylight and all you know. It's kind of funny. It's the 6500 Kelvin I like so much, but you know it's freshwater. <laughs> and my ongoing joke is no, 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 not freshwater, nothing, never. But uh, yeah, because this is a saltwater channel. Let's see. Um, let's see. Okay, Jonathan says something interesting here. He says, for me, buying corals online has been a nightmare. I've had big issues with the most with most of the big five sellers, the top five. That's interesting. Uh, it, it can be challenging in this uh, 
day and age to get things online. I've had a few uh, mishaps. I've had crazy things happen. I had a vendor who asked me to do a review on a light, and then he shipped a box to me, and I opened it up, and it was full of livestock. <laughs> I'm like, there's no light in this box, but there's a whole bunch of these fish. And he's like, oh, you're the one that got the fish. Apparently, the boxes were identical after they'd been packed, and they didn't know which was light and which one was uh, uh, fish. And they must have weighed about the same and looked identical, so it was a goof. Uh, but uh, I received one order from one company of livestock. The water was super hot. I could barely acclimate the stuff. Some of it died, and I never bought from them again. So, I mean, it happens to all of us. You just have to do your best. Let's see. Okay, let's talk about this. Uh, we're, Jonathan, it's you again. <laughs> You've commented quite a few times. Uh, a lot of reputable sellers will send me junk, like Aptasia, Vermitid snails, and worms. Those are hitchhikers, and that can happen with any coral, with any vendor, unless you expect them to sit there and scrape them clean and make sure they're devoid of them. That's why we get our corals, we inspect them, we dip them, some people even quarantine them to make sure there's nothing on. Some people will cut the coral right off the frag swap, uh, off the uh, frag plug, and throw the plug away because of all the pests, and just save the coral and glue that in their rock work uh, to, re to reduce or eliminate the risk of introducing something they don't want. But, uh, you know, those kind of critters, while they're a pest, they are not something that I feel are a major issue. And so I don't really sweat it, you know, and so if I get anything online, whether it's rock or cleanup crew or occasionally a coral, I just deal with it, you know, just take care of it. Let's see. Oh, feel free to ask any questions today, guys. Jason was at Aquashella. He says, we drove six hours each way for one day at Aquashella in Chicago, and it was definitely worth the trip. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really fun event, and a lot of people were there. A lot of it was filmed, and I filmed some of it, but there was a lot of YouTubers, and so you probably can just start hitting YouTube and type in Aquashella Chicago 2019 and see what kind of results you get. But I think you'll find all kinds of cool things to see. Uh, Jess Ramirez says, how do you find the frag swaps? Uh, typically, you can just type in frag swap near me, and uh, see what Google finds. Uh, you can do saltwater frag swap and see what spits out because almost anyone doing an event will publish it somewhere. They'll either publish it as an event on Facebook, they'll publish it on their club's website. Um, it could be a bigger business like Reefapalooza. That's actually a frag swap. It's just a huge one <laughs> with vendors. And uh, those events take place all over the nation um, every single year. And like later this month is Reefapalooza Chicago. Aquashella just left and now Reefapalooza is coming in. So that's one that maybe is, if you're near Chicago, would be worth the trip for you. But uh, you can also ask online and you can ask your, friend, your saltwater friends, hey, have you heard of any frag swaps in our area and see what kind of feedback you get. If there's a club in your area, check their website. And if you're not a member of their club, join the club, support the clubs. There is no reason that we should not be club members. I've been the same club member, you know, with my with DFW MAS since 2002. And uh, clubs have all kinds of fun functions, and they have frag swaps. And so you'll be, if you're a member, you're going to get emails telling you, hey, the frag swaps, you know, in X amount of weeks, and prepare to come, and come have a great time and join us. So there you go. Uh, Michael says, what will be your next coral? I don't know. Um, I'm not really shopping for anything right now. I'm just trying to keep everything I have alive and happy. And I, you know, I'm kind of in the ACAN phase right now. I'm enjoying those. I have about four or five or six in the back of my reef uh, in a spot that I can't reach. <laughs> and I would, and it's funny because one, the frag plug fell over, and I, I might be wrong about this, but this is what I think I'm seeing. The frag plug fell over near a big parietes coral, and a parietes, this parietes is um, pretty aggressive. And I swear, the polyps all jumped off the frag plug and landed somewhere else because they're just lying flat on the sand. I just don't believe there's anything underneath them except maybe they're making new calcium skeleton underneath. And so when I finally do get my walk board and I can get back on top of the tank and reach down in there, I'm going to move everything over to this end of the tank, um, right behind that gorgonian. Boy, that tank... This tank looks completely different to me than it does on this screen. It is so blue in that shot and so blurry. 
I'm hoping at some point that this streaming software will allow me to actually paste, you know, do the green screen thing and paste a video of my reef in the background where it's all crisp and beautiful and you can see all the details. But that hasn't quite happened yet, so I'm waiting for that to be released. Um, let's see. Uh, Coral Lover says, what ab about if stuff is dying after a few days? Why is that happening? Well, it could be the livestock was not in good shape, number one. Number two, it could have been overly stressed during transport, but it was enough to hang in there, but then just didn't quite make it. Uh, it could be your acclimation process was not ideal. Um, and then finally, it could just be the, and, and then there's also, which we always hear this, but we still, as individual hobbyists, don't have a way to prove it. There's always the discussion of cyanide. Oh, it was caught with cyanide. I'm sure that's why it died. I'm like, okay, you're not sure of anything. You're assuming. But there are fish, to this day, apparently, it's shocking to me, they're still finding, uh, or they're still catching fish with cyanide. They're squirting it at the livestock in the reef, and it stuns them because they're poisoned, and they can catch them more easily and put them in a bag and send them to the U.S., and we buy them for a lot of money. And then the thing doesn't live very long, you know, less than 14 days. There is a chance it was that. It could be other things. It could be internal parasites. It could be, uh, you know, some kind of infection in the gills. Um, so sometimes we don't know why things die. Certain companies offer better deals than others. You know, like, uh, for example, Live Aquaria has a 14-day guarantee. And I'm, that may be specific to Diver's Den, but, uh, you know, that's why I'm saying read their rules on the website so you know what you're getting before you get it. So you have some kind of options or you know what to do if things don't go perfectly. Are there any corals that can coexist with bubble tip and enemies? Well, I mean, there's a lot that can coexist. In other words, share the same tank. But if the anemone touches it, typically the anemone wins. Very rarely will a coral be able to push an anemone away. <laughs> I think the anemone almost wins every single time. Maybe a hydnophora could handle it. Maybe. Or uh, possibly an elegance coral. But mm, usually the anemone wreaks havoc. It finds a spot it likes, and then you have corals everywhere else in the reef. And I've had anemones now since 2003. And uh, I've had them in the same tank with mushrooms and with cold coral, with SPS corals, with a clam. There's a lot of things. And if your anemone is up high, you can have all kinds of corals down low. You can have zoanthids, you can have recordias, you can uh, have montipora at the bottom. You know, just nothing within reach of the tentacles. So if you can avoid that, then uh, yeah. They can definitely coexist. My uh, anemone cube has uh, an acan at the bottom that's about this big around. It's got uh, a big Montipora colony that Dory sleeps in. It's got uh, a couple of walking dendroph uh, dendrophilia on the sand bed. Um, there's a bunch of little tiny anemones. What else is in there? Oh, and I got some fungia, fungia plates in there too. So yeah, you can have things down away from the tentacles and that'll work. Uh, Steph Stefan, I guess, says, is there any kind of info out there to correctly identify species of coral? Actually, there is. I believe the website is AIMS, um, and they're a coral identification website that's very um, intricate, and it, I think it was made in Australia. Uh, the book I like to recommend is Corals by Eric Borneman, and that's a hardcover book. Someone recently, uh, I mentioned it to someone recently, they needed to get that book, and they found it on Amazon as an ebook for like $17. And it's all about identifying coral species, and it covers a lot of them, and it's a great book. So uh, if you're wanting to like compare to what something you have in your tank or something you saw online you want to buy it, you can flip through the book and see if it's right or if it's close. Ames is, uh, their coral identification system is even more precise because they will take a piece of the coral. Unfortunately, they will kill it, they will bleach it, and they'll take a picture of the skeleton to see exactly what the polyp structure was of the skeletal base. And they can say, based on the distance between each of the polyps and the depth and the ridges and all the stuff, we know it's such and such a species. And they'll show the skeleton and they'll show maybe three more pictures of the coral in different situations to kind of give you kind of a, a brief overview. But, uh, and that was the thing. <laughs> I remember... Back in the old days, you know, people would say, hey, what kind of acro is this? And 
someone would always say, I don't know, dip it in bleach and tell us. <laughs> I was just like, ugh. You know, because, you know, I don't want to kill any corals, you know, I have no desire to do that. So it is nice to know what you have or what you're getting. Uh, it's good to write it down, take notes, take a picture um, of the coral at the fish store, and then take a picture of the little sign so you can see what it is, and they're side by side in your camera roll and you can scroll through later and remind yourself what you bought. Um, if you're lucky, the actual, uh, it's not going to happen, but it would be nice if it was on the receipt. Or you could just look at the receipt and say, oh, okay. But, you know, usually it'll just say corals. Um, those are the best way, and of course asking other people. It's very, very hard to identify a frag, but a colony usually can be identified because there's more to it. When you start off with something this big, we're like, well, it could be this, this, or even this, and they're completely different animals. But, uh, you know, so that would be my recommendation is to get Corals by Eric Borneman. Mad River says, you can buy your anemone first and plant it in the reef and then add your corals, but it may wander. And that is one of the things, this tank used to have a couple of rows of anemones in it when I first set it up. And the uh, anemone was down here and there was one on the back side. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool because I had a couple of pairs of clowns and I thought one pair could be on the front, one pair could be in the back, and no one's going to fight because they can't see each other. Well, guess what? The ones in the front kept going to the back to beat up the other guys, <laughs> which was insane. They're completely out of sight. I'm like, nope, you got to die. So I had to rescue them. And I had all of my corals in my, on my frags uh, on the pegging system that I've done a video about where I put the corals in these little holes inside the rockwork. And then after the, uh, and then, you know, I enjoyed the reef. And then if the anemone started reaching up, I pulled all the corals out and put them in other holes till the anemone went back to its spot. And then I put them all back where they went again. It was, it was kind of a, a crazy game of, uh, I don't know, musical chairs. So that was a, my workaround, but eventually I just decided, you know what? No anemones. Let's not look at this. <laughs> no anemones in my big reef anymore. I'm setting up the anemone cube, and that's why I did that. I set up that tank years ago, specifically just to keep them in there. And then the sea bay thing just kind of happened, and you know, here we are today. But that one's been pretty much a model citizen. You've heard a couple of stories about it, but for the most part, it's been doing really well in that spot. All right. Uh, oh, Rick. Rick asks, uh, is the Mindstream up and running? It's right there. And it is running. It's running fine. It's, uh, I've got a good connection. I'm able to check my stats on a regular basis. And that's made me really happy. I, um, I'm using it and I'm comparing it to what the Trident says on the Apex controller to see their numbers. I'm always looking at them both. And, uh, and today is water test Saturday and I must actually physically test my water. I got to pull out the test kits and see where things are because I'm kind of getting a little reliant on the electronic gear and I need to get out my reagents and actually do the hobbyist thing <laughs> and verify my facts. There's one thing that I have not done for over six months and that is dose magnesium. I went ahead and I stopped because the Trident said my magnesium was over 1400 and I just thought well that can't be right because my test kit says it's like 1250 to 1300 but it's always saying I'm over 1400 almost as much as 1500. So I just stopped dosing it. And I've had a few Monty's just turn white. <laughs> I just, they just got more and more pale. And uh, I've lost a couple. And I feel like it's because there's not enough magnesium. So I don't know what the deal is. Now, since getting the new Mindstream, it's measuring my magnesium and it's kind of matching the Trident, which doesn't help my argument at all because now both are saying my magnesium is quite high. But Montipora love magnesium. So at this point, I'm almost ready to just start dosing it and see if the Trident and the Mindstream both go uphill to join what I'm doing. You know, maybe I can track what's happening. But I just think my tank needs a gallon or two of magnesium added to it to uh, really get my corals to color up again. And, you know, it could be that they just bleached out from the uh, no-pox bath they've been in for so long. Um, I'm wrapping up the end of my bottle. Um, I told you guys after this I'm done. It's uh, running at three milliliters every six hours right now. Um, I'll probably reduce that down to like two or one. I'm just trying to taper the reef off so it doesn't just go from dose, dose, dose to stop. That way I don't shock the system because that literally would. That stuff was um, potent enough that I believe removing it suddenly would be just as hard as adding it suddenly. So I'm tapering it off. Uh, Michael, I can't show the frag tank. I've got issues with it right now. It's back there. And uh, one of the lights is burned out, and uh, it's just kind of in miserable mode right now. And I keep saying I'm going to reset it, and I just haven't had the time. 
and I'm going to, uh, when I do I'm going to basically break it down, clean it up. I'm going to change the plumbing to make it quieter. And uh, something else I want to do, to, and i got to fix the light situation. I don't know what's going on there. So the tank is just, ugh. But when I reset it, I'm going to set it up differently this time where it actually has a frag rack in the front, which I fight tooth and nail to do, but even my best friends are like, you got to have a frag rack there with some frags in there. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. So I'm going to set it up differently this time. And when I do that, of course I'll share it at that point when it's worth showing. But right now it's, it's nothing good to look at. <laughs> um... Mohammed says, do you sh sell out of the United States? Yes, I do. I ship things all over the place. I've been shipping, I, recently I shipped to uh, Denmark. I've shipped to UK a couple times. Uh, I shipped some things to Australia. It just depends on what you want, what it costs, how big a box it has to be and its weight. And I can just give you a quote. So you can just tell me what you're looking to buy and I can look it up. This is, I guess, the perfect time to put this on the screen. Please shop from milosreef.com because it helps me feed my fish and keep my belly round. I, uh, the company's been doing really well. I actually just recently realized it's been 10 years that I made Milo's Reef my sole form of income. I, uh, you know, the YouTube thing was kind of more recent. That only happened the last three, three and a half years. But um, I, in, back in 2009, I said, that's it. I'm going to make Milo's Reef work and I'm going to, you know, survive or I'm going to starve to death and I won't have to work anymore. <laughs> And somehow I have not starved to death. So I, I appreciate all your orders. And when they come through, it always makes me super happy. I always appreciate that you guys put trust in me and you use my website. And, uh, you know, that you send some of your business my way. This year may be the first year I'm going to hit a thousand orders shipped. Which is kind of huge for a one-man operation. But uh, we'll see. Who knows what's going to happen next couple of months. I should mention, this is actually kind of a good time to also mention this as well. So your your orders really do help me uh, stay in business, and I do appreciate that. And I have, uh, you've, you've been hearing about my back problem now for, uh, I don't know, a couple of months, because it's been bad for a couple of months. I went to see the surgeon yesterday, and he reviewed the CAT scan with me. And uh, I have a picture I can show you guys. <sighs> <clears throat> So, let's see if I can find this. So, that is my neck. Let me turn this off. That is my neck. And right, will this zoom? Or maybe I'd zoom it on here. Yeah. So, that nice shiny thing, that is the disc they put in four years ago. And above it, you can see, I don't think you can see anything. I'm talking about this. Oh, let's see if I can do markup. That would be kind of cool. Edit. I thought those are marks. They've changed all the tools now. I don't know where anything is. <laughs> no, I don't see the markup. Oh, well. Uh, anyway, this spot here, right there in the dead center, those little hooks. Apparently, those hooks are like stabbing my spinal column. Uh, and that right there is where all my pain is coming from. So the surgeon wants to put the same disc that you see, the shiny thing, in the gap above it and the one above that. And if all goes well, it will take care of me. So that is my hope. So that right there is a big deal. Um, last time I did the surgery, you guys saw the cut on my neck. And um, that one, you know, it took a while to heal. It was about four weeks of recovery time, and then I was kind of back to work. And so he says, we got to put in two, because I don't want you to keep coming back every four years. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I don't want to keep coming back every four years either. And he says, so I want to put those discs inside there, just like we did last time. And we're going to go up and up, and we're just going to take care of all that. And I was like, okay, that sounds great. How long's recovery? And he said, it's still four weeks. So that's kind of promising. I, uh, I'm tentatively scheduled to deal with this on December 10th. Um, i got to do some physical therapy first for insurance purposes. And then hopefully uh, nothing will go wrong, and the doctor will say, yep, yeah, or the surgeon will say, we're, we're doing this. And so if I do it, that'll be December, which is, like I said, the 10th. That's kind of just before Christmas season. And I know a lot of people like to buy things for their spouses or for their uh, significant others uh, for the reef tank. And, you know, I'm happy to fill any orders, but, you know, once I've had my neck sliced open, I will be slower. And it'll be harder for me to fill orders, those last-minute orders that are trying to get to you by Christmas. So you might have to think ahead a little bit if you're buying things from the shop so I can get that stuff out to you in a timely fashion. But other than that, um, I'm hoping for a lot less pain 
Um, I almost had a migraine two days ago again. The pain always starts back here and works its way up my neck. And it was uh, <clears throat> another bad day. I mean, I made a huge breakfast and I took a hydrocodone and it just kind of numbed it. it. All you're doing is hiding the problem. It doesn't solve anything. And, you know, I take those very rarely, but I was in a lot of pain. And, uh, you know, the rest of the time I take a leave like a regular person. I, I'm not trying to waste the opioids <laughs> that the government's so worried about these days. But yeah, the pain's with me constantly, and it looks like I probably have about two more months of it, of this pain, and then hopefully we can go in and fix it. And I'm thinking, after he slices open, so that's the one cut. I'm gonna have a new one on this side. I'm gonna be wearing a turtleneck on YouTube from now on because it's gonna be all sliced and diced. <laughs> I said, can't you go from the back? I'm on YouTube! And he was just smiling, he goes, no. <laughs> so that's kind of the dash on that one, uh, or the, uh, the, the data. I just wanted to kind of bring you guys up to speed on that. Um, I just saw a good question here. See, while I was chatting about my rambling story, it gave you an opportunity to ask more questions. Uh, let's see. Here it is. Um, so Hala at Sharif Boy said, thanks for watching, uh, what's the oldest coral you have? And I believe the oldest coral I have is a Blue Ridge coral because I got that tank in 2003. So I've got some of it, well, some was alive in the anemone queue, but the tentacles are everywhere, so probably there's none left. But there's a huge patch of it on the back of the reef. And a Blue Ridge coral is not anything special. I mean, when people see it, like, ooh, you have Blue Ridge. <laughs> I'm like, you care? It's, uh, it's brown. It, it's hard there's no movement and it grows these weird bumps and off the bumps these little like uh fibers will come out in mine it's always just been some hairs but i was visiting a store in louisiana a few years ago and they had this massive colony of something in the back of the tank and it was just covered with white stuff and i was like it looks like snowflakes what is that and they said it's blue ridge coral and i was shocked so why the name blue ridge if you were to break the coral open inside it it's blue so it got the name Blue Ridge. But uh, when you look at it, it's just brown, like honey brown, and it can put out these like snowflake type polyps when it wants to. It's a strange coral because it's a hard coral, but from time to time it sheds. And it will literally send off this mucus off of its body, and then it looks super shiny. And you know, people will look at it and say, wow, it looks like it's wet inside your tank. It, it looks wet. I'm like, I know. And then you know, another time they come like, yeah, it doesn't look wet this time. <laughs> so it's kind of a cool coral. Um, I have a feeling it may not even be something you can get anymore legally. I'm not positive about that, but I have this feeling it's like a protected species. And mine came with a used tank I bought, so that's why I got it. And I gave quite a few pieces to people over the years. And maybe a company like Unique Corals out of California might have some Blue Ridge that you could purchase if you were interested. It's, it's kind of a neat coral. It, it's very simple. It doesn't have any high demands. Just maintain normal reef quality uh, water parameters and... It should just do its thing quietly in the background. It is not a fast grower. It is not worth a lot of money. You can't frag it to re re get your money back. Just something to enjoy. That's all it is. Let's see. All right. Jess says, is there a rule of thumb of what percent of water you should be changed each week or each month? The general uh, rule is 25% once a month. Uh, but there are people out there that are actually doing weekly water changes or even daily water changes with an automated system where it changes a couple of gallons. So like, let's say you had to change, um, let's just take an easy number, 30 gallons each month. You could do one gallon a day. You could uh, do seven gallons every week or you could do 30 gallons all at once. For myself, I, um, I kind of like the idea of just a big one where you pull out a whole bunch of dirty water and you put in a bunch of clean water but there was an article written by Randy Holmes Farley who actually did a study to compare how your water does because he was pretty sure the big change was uh, the more effective method. And with all of his science and math and everything, he says, actually, the daily water changes are just as effective. So that was interesting. I did not expect that answer. So you, if you want to do something more frequent, you can. Now, you asked what the general rule is. You didn't ask what I do. <laughs> and I very rarely change water. Uh, but that will change. Uh, once my neck is good, I'll, I'll be more proactive with my tank when it comes to changing water, I think. Um, next weekend, I'm just throwing this out there before I forget, I will not be doing a live stream because I will be speaking in Iowa. 
so I won't be in town. So there will be no live stream next weekend. Maybe some little video will roll out at 2 o'clock to fill that gap, if I have time. <clears throat> Uh, coral Lover says, my leather coral is not opening for over a week. The rest of my corals look great. I've had this coral for six months and it was looking amazing. What is the problem? Leather corals can close up. They can actually uh, shut down for a couple of reasons. It uh, could be there's a water imbalance. It could be there's a fish nipping at the polyps. Or it could just be at that stage of shedding. A leather coral sheds every month. And so a lot of flow helps to get that off of its body so it can open up again. You might try taking a turkey baster to it. Um, you want to double check your water parameters, make sure everything's right. You know, double check your numbers. Don't just say, yeah, I tested, it's good. Double check what you tested with to make sure that the test is right. And uh, if calcium is good, and alkalinity is good, and temperature is good, and salinity is good, and magnesium is good, phosphates are low, nitrates are low, maybe it just needs a little more flow, maybe it just needs a little more time. But leather corals are very hardy, and they can go through a lot, and they can have times where they don't look happy. But I had a, uh, when I grew from a piece this big, into a thing as big around as a trash can. And there was, and for the beginning part, the first couple of years, it was just like smooth, like a mushroom and, you know, and a stalk. And I was like, all right, it's kind of all right. And when my powder blue tang died, because I always saw the powder blue like mowing it down, you know, like there'd be something stick out and he would go nip at it. And I didn't really know what was happening because I didn't know that coral that well at the time. And I just kind of observed and thought, okay, that's normal, right? Well, it turns out it wasn't normal at all. The powder blue tang was harassing my coral, but my coral kept growing. I think it put the polyps out at night when the fish was asleep, and then all day long it sucked them in. And if it put out a couple, the powder blue was like, oh no, I'm here, chomp, chomp, chomp. Like, you know, so the coral ended up, when the fish died in an accident, that coral became this gorgeous showpiece, and I was like, I had no idea this coral could look this way. And uh, it was very popular. People loved that, that, that coral. And like I said, it was massive. I grew it from a tiny frag to something huge in six years. Speaking of six years, uh, this tank is one month away from the six-year anniversary. So November 10th is the big date. And uh, we got to get there. We got to get to November 10th. That's really important to me. Because the last reef tank, be okay, before this one leaked, <laughs> the last reef tank almost made it six years and failed just like three days short. So I want to get to November 10th. Anything after that is bonus as far as I'm concerned. It will be a new record in my household. Well, that's not really true. I had the 29 gallon for seven years. Anyway, big tanks, I'm trying to get past six years. It's a record I'm, I'm aiming for. So... Um, okay, Eric says, do you have any problems introducing a mandarin dragonette into your system? I had mine separate set up to put on some... Oh, he kept it separate to let it fatten up. And when I add him, he's immediately picked on and I had to take him out. Um, I always recommend using the Peacemaker. It's a product I sell. But uh, you can do whatever you want. You can make something yourself if you want. You don't have to buy it from me. But you should. <laughs> uh, the Peacemaker is a box with a lot of holes in it. And I just built myself a new one for my own tank because I've had the same one, which was the prototype, that I probably made in 2011, 2012. And, you know, it just wasn't as nice as what I make these days. So I made myself a new one uh, recently. And the box is suspended from the top of my tank. So there's a big piece of acrylic on the top and it sits on the rim. And then the box is hanging right here. And it's got a lot of holes in it. And I put any new fish after it's been um, put through safety stop, I put it in that box and it stays inside the reef right between the two uh, flow accelerators and it stays there for three days where all the fish can see it and then on the third day and I feed the reef and I feed that fish at the exact same time so they're all getting food and I you know that's how I handle it and after three days I can pour it into the tank and no one cares I have seen zero aggression with lots of different fish I've done this with and so I feel like it's a great method and I recommend it. Now some, like I said, some people will try and make their own with um, some kind of a fish fry holder, you know, that you can get at Petco or PetSmart, but that's, it's white, you can't see through it. Um, others have made it with egg crate. Um, it's kind of ugly, but it works. It's another way to create a corral to put something in that no one can fight. I remember way, way back in the old days, uh, someone had this beautiful reef tank 
and she had a, a fish skirmish and she put a piece of acrylic down uh, so you know the the tank was a rectangle and she put down a piece of acrylic the full length no it wasn't acrylic it was that great she did it at a 45 degree angle and, and put the fish behind it so it was behind this vertical fence and so no one could attack and after a few days she removed it to have them interact so sometimes i think it's just taking a new fish it's floating in a bag for let's say 40 minutes or so or an hour and then it goes into the tank and everyone is like who the heck is that <laughs> i must kill it so and part of the reason is is because a brand new fish is typically stressed and the stress hormone releases into the water and the other fish say, oh my God, we need to attack whatever that is. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's like a magnetic thing. And so they're just drawn to the stress and they feel they should destroy it. And so by having the fish in the box, I kind of feel like any stress it has, hopefully it's less and less and less. And when you finally pour it in, it just kind of cruises in. It's happy to get in there. Um, if you're using the Peacemaker with wrasses, you could put a small bowl with sand in the bottom for that wrasse to go into for shelter at night when it wants to sleep. I actually feel kind of bad about wrasses in the Peacemaker because mine is clear on the bottom so they can see the reef and so the fish can see it. But I'll see the wrasse like hitting the bottom trying to get down to the reef and cannot because there's a, a barrier. And I, I, it makes me feel a little bit bad. It makes me want to put something across the entire bottom just so it can't see the, the floor of the reef. But I've never done it. I just, you know, like I said, as far it, that's as far as my feelings when I feel bad. But... You know, I just didn't sweat it, and I just, I knew it was only going to last three days. Uh, let's see. ATF says, what are your top three recommended uh, online fish and invert vendors? <laughs> Diver's Den, live aquarium would be number one. Cost more, but they quarantine their stuff to make sure it's eating food before you ever get it, and it gets that 14-day guarantee. That's number one. Um, number two. Uh, for corals, I'd say unique corals. I love the way they package their stuff. They seem to really care. I've been to their facilities. It's very clean. I like that one a lot. Um, I haven't purchased from Tidal Gardens, but you know he's got a great uh, uh, reputation. So I bet that's another nice, safe one. And then for inverts, there's like six different companies you can get uh, inverts from. I mentioned reef cleaners before. Um, I think there's another one called like Gulf aquatic ecosystems or something i feel like they're out of florida um i'd have to look but i don't buy much livestock <laughs> and uh the occasional time i do you know it's more like a oh uh, i just i i think i make the decision on the fly when i finally decide what to do so i don't know if that helped jake says i have a huge aptasia problem do you have any ideas um well there's this product that frank's tanks has recently released and he even said I could sell it in my shop. Um, so it's a product that's different from other Aptasia killing solutions because typically people have used things like lemon juice and acid and Kalkwasser paste and Joe's juice and Aptasia X. I mean, these are all products you just squirt on it or in it and it's supposed to weaken them off and kill them. This stuff, you mix it up and it sits on top of it and creates like a crust. And then after three days or so, you go in and you remove what's left. Um, it just kind of kills them completely. It smothers them, I guess. And uh, it's apparently really popular. So if you could find that, the name of it is F Aptasia. And yes, the F stands for what you think it stands for. Mark D says, what do you think of all nice signature Acropora? The price sometimes are $1,000. Each store makes his own name. Uh, so the same time, they, oh, so at the same time, there are five different Acroporas with the exact same name. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that. I mean, you know. And, you know, if, they, if I see something pretty and I say, well, how much is it? And then they have some crazy price. I'm like, okay. I'm not getting it. <laughs> someone will buy it. There's always someone willing to do that, but it won't be me. But uh, in the old, you know, I mean, I keep saying the old days. It just, we handled things differently in the past. I remember when names were just becoming a thing. And there was a few guys in the U.S. that were really good at growing corals. And one of them was Steve Tyree. And Steve Tyree sold corals, and he does a coral uh, farmer's market all over the U.S. I think he does like six or eight of them a year or something, maybe even more. And so that could be another frag swap you're looking for. Um, the coral farmer's market. But in the old days, he would sell these corals, and he had a wait list on his website. And you could go to the website, and you'd see the coral, you'd see the, the colony, and he would put the price... And you would have to send them an email saying, I, I want to get in line. And there'd be a spreadsheet on the page. And you could see your, like, number 64. 
on that list and your odds of, and let's just say you're looking at this in 2003 and you would say, you'll get your coral in April of 2015. <laughs> you're just like, wow, <laughs> it's like, that's forever, you know? And you, you always wanted to like bribe him to get bumped up the list, you know? <laughs> we're, we're horrible, you know, humans, we're horrible. But uh, I remember that, that was how, and he had names for his corals back then. The names thing has really taken off. And the more crazy or exotic the name or funny or, or dirty it is, the more popular it seems to be. I mean, uh, Home Wrecker um, uh, is just one that comes to mind. I mean, Walt Disney kind of came out of nowhere uh, name-wise, and yet everyone's talking about it all of a sudden. I don't know how the buzz went so quick with that coral. And it wasn't crazy expensive. I think frags were about 80 bucks a piece. Maybe more. It was probably more in the beginning. But uh, it was just an acropora tenuous. And uh, I have a piece in my tank. There's just green. <laughs> it's not pretty. And you know, it hasn't really grown much. Matter of fact, the vendor that uh, I got it from said, man, I thought that'd be huge by now. I was like, no, it's just stagnant. It's just kind of sitting there doing its thing. I actually moved it from a spot that was kind of shaded into a spot that was more bright and it just got, it turned green. It went downhill. But again, could be the chemicals I'm putting in my tank to fight nitrate might have been the cause. Don't know. Um, will you be making your way to Nemo's new store in Charlotte anytime? Uh, if I'm in Charlotte, I, I always like to visit different fish stores. It's fun. I do enjoy it. I don't have it as a plan, but it could happen. Dennis? 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 Uh, said, how old should a tank be before buying an anemone? Uh, I really like to encourage people to wait nine months. That doesn't mean you have to, but I feel like when you wait nine months, you have become more in sync with your aquarium. You know its needs. You can see the problems from afar. You're just more, you have become more mature with the tank as it's gotten more mature. The bacteria has grown throughout the rock work. It has infused the sand bed. And uh, you've, you've, you've already lived through all those stupid little things that happen where you make dumb mistakes. And now it's kind of getting into its, uh, into its groove. And I think at that point is a good time to add one. But like I said, you know, some people don't want to wait that long and don't even recommend waiting that long. But I, I, like, I really like nine months or older. <laughs> I, I see I've got comments from something I said 20 minutes ago. So uh, made me laugh. Michael says, do you have a quarantine tank? I do not. I used to have a quarantine tank running 24 seven. And when I rebuilt this room way back in 2011, I made room for one, but I never did it. And that right around that time is when Safety Stop came out, which everything, when it comes to quarantine, I'm not about quarantine corals. I'm more about quarantining fish. And when Safety Stop came out, it was called Rapid Fish Quarantine. I was so impressed. I was, <laughs> I was so amazed. I was like, everyone should be buying this. And I sell a lot of it. Um, it's a way to put your fish through a double bath over a two hour period before they go in your tank. And it gets rid of all the external parasites. Doesn't get rid of internal parasites. Apparently the only way to get rid of internal parasites is to give the fish a medicated food that goes in their gut. And that will then push out whatever evil thing is inside their bellies. But for the external parasites, Safety Stop works great, and it has completely spoiled me to, to quarantine tanks. And so I haven't done one in a long time. And I've been feeling I probably should do one because I run a YouTube channel, and it's an educational channel, I should be setting a good example. So it's always in the back of my mind just something I, I may do at some point, do a video about. But as of this time, no, the honest answer is I don't have one right now. And then I was just asked, what do you think is the best zoa, <laughs> uh, as in zoanthid? I don't have a favorite. And uh, what's my favorite coral? Mm. I guess the shadow caster, which is this one here that looks all blown out on camera. But uh, the shadow caster has been an amazing coral for the last uh, six years of my life and has grown. And it's just a really wild staghorn. I really like it a lot. It's I don't know. I'm very close to it. I don't know why. <laughs> There's others in there I like, but uh, I, I, I guess I really enjoy what I've lived through with a shadow caster. Uh, ATF says, I need to make a few things with acrylic. What type do you need? The source? How best to cut? What about glues? I think you need to go to my website. My website has all of that information. 
in the articles section, click on acrylics and just read your way through everything because I've got DIY tutorials on there. I've got examples. I show how to route. I show what bits to use, what glue to use. It's all on there. And sources, just look up plastics in the, uh, well, I'd say in the yellow pages, but look up plastics on Google and you'll find some phone numbers to plastic suppliers in your local area and you can start calling them and find out what their minimum price is because a lot of times there will be a minimum you have to spend <clears throat> to buy something from them because they're not you know, a lot of stores are not set up they're set up to sell sheets of acrylic and not to give you a certain piece uh, they can also cut things for you in advance they can laser cut it and be very precise it'll be kind of expensive but it'll be done but then you have to sand all the edges of anything lasered before you can glue it you cannot glue lasered edges to other acrylic it will not bond uh, Denise says what do you feed your fish uh, occasionally Spock will get banana. Uh, this is Spock right, what? right here. I've had that fish since 2004. Um, occasionally, you know, like four times a year. I just hold a little bit of banana in the water and she comes and gnaws it off and then I break it up in my fingers and let go everywhere and the purple tang eats it and the anthias eat it and the clownfish grab it and everyone gets excited. But the regular food is a sheet of nori every day. Um, I have an auto feeder at the top of my tank that drops in food twice a day and uh, just some flake food. Uh, that you can't buy anymore so I can't recommend it <laughs> because I'm just using my stash until it's empty um, and then at night I do Rod's food for my frozen food and I do that every single night so my tank is basically getting three to four meals a day and the anemone cube is getting two meals a day because it gets the auto feeder and then it gets the frozen Rod's food let's see I see everyone's talking about my back now I must be up to that point Oh, I got to put this on the screen. Thank you for putting that on there. Recently made a purchase from Milo's Reef and had a great experience. I, I really do want to make each customer happy. And, you know, I can't always get everything out as quickly as I'd hoped, but I do my best. And anything I can get out quickly, I will get it out, like, the next day. And if it takes, you know, especially if it's something I have to build, you know, there's going to be a delay because I have to build it. But uh, I, even then, as I'm building it, I want it to be right. And I don't just slap it together and stick it in a box. I, I put it together. If it doesn't look right, I redo it and do it again. And then I let it cure for a couple days before I can go in a box so it doesn't come apart or, or bake and ruin the seams in shipping, you know, especially in these summer months. So, uh, yeah, uh, I've been trying to knock out orders as quick as I can. I've been, a lot of people, and you know, it's funny, I talked to this YouTube channel like you're all my customers. And I know not all of you buy from me, but I, th I feel like anyone that buys from me probably sees my videos. And so I'm always saying things on here that doesn't actually say on my website. Like, for example, if you buy this little thing right here, I can ship it for $6. My website might say it's $14.54 or $18, and you don't have the option for $6, and I just tell people I will refund you the difference. And it seems like everyone's kind of figured it out. That's why I feel like everyone buying is on my YouTube channel, <laughs> because they seem to know the process now. They don't mind. And yeah, as soon as it goes out the door, I send out that refund for the difference. And I just had someone order from Alaska, and, you know, the website charged a lot. You know, FedEx wanted, like, $68 to ship the box, and I was able to do it for 34 So I sent him a difference, you know, back, and that way he saved some money, you know, because I'm not, I don't want to take advantage of you guys, and it's just the system. So I've uh, talked to my web developer. We've tried to do things, um, but in the meantime, that's just what I do. I just try to be an honest vendor, and I try to take care of you guys. And I had one person, he, I remember this, it was funny, it just stands out my mind. He said, was there something wrong? You sent me a refund. <laughs> I said, I shipped it for less money, so I sent you a refund in shipping. And he was like, oh. And then he said something back like, in this hobby, that amount of money is nothing. You don't have to do that. And I was like, no, no, I felt it was the right thing to do. And that's why I did it. So, uh, Coral uh, Lover says, what do you think about DIY fish food? I actually have a website, uh, an article on my website about how to make your own fish food. And you can go to the Asian market. That's a great place to get a lot of the ingredients. You want raw, fresh seafood, and you may want to add in other foods that you get from the fish store as well and turn this into a mush of your own flavor that you like. You can add uh, things like, um, what is that stuff? Uh, my brain is saying a brand name, not this. There's this liquid that a lot of people like to add to their foods to add more nutrients and, and enrich the food. So that is a... Some people add garlic to the food, but it seems like everyone's saying that no longer does anything, so I don't know. I still smell garlic in my food, so I think it's still in there. 
Um, but you can make your own, and you can make it alone, your own cheaply and make several months worth at a time. Uh, for me, I just like prepared foods made for aquariums, and I just stopped making it myself. Let's see. I'm getting a lot of questions here. I'm going to try and answer them quickly. What's your advice on tangs? Uh, you want to get them small, and you want to make sure that you're not getting too many for the tank. You want them to be all different sizes and shapes. In other words, um, I have shapes, not sizes. If you get small, small is great. Get everything small. And then you don't want them to look alike because if they look, if they have the same body shape, they tend to fight. So if you can put like a coal tang with a yellow tang with a dusamiri with a hippo, those are all four different shapes and they won't have any problems. But you put a purple tang with a yellow tang with a gem tang, and you might see them all struggling with each other because they all kind of have that look-alike thing and they all get angry with each other. So on that one, I like small because it can grow into your system, and as it grows, you can get a bigger tank, and you can move it to the bigger tank. And uh, another question was, what is the best beginner SPS? And I would say the best beginner SPS would be um, Pasilopora. And that is a nice, colorful coral. It comes in like four or five different colors. It's an SPS. It doesn't demand a lot of light. It, it does really well in aquariums. And it can even spread. So there are some people out there that absolutely won't have it. I've actually had Pasilopore in several of my reefs over the years. And it was just pretty. Uh, it never did anything like I was warm. Matter of fact, I have a piece of green Pasilopore in the center between those acros. And it's about this big around now. And it's... Uh, Hasn't done a thing. You know, I, like I'm not finding more pieces of it elsewhere in my reef, like they say, uh, which does happen, but it hasn't happened to me. But that one's a good one. That was actually my first SPS coral. <laughs> so, someone said, wear a nice thick uh, gold or silver chain around your neck after the surgery. <laughs> Just have my bling to distract you from the wounds. I like that. That's hilarious. Um... Odile says, do you have any toadstool leathers? I do. I have a, a Steve Tyree green polyp toadstool leather in the back. It started as a very small piece, and now it's probably about this big around and leaning on the glass, and it's uh, right behind the anemone. It's right there, but impossible to see from this angle. Okay. We have about 15 minutes left, guys. <laughs> Um, Michael says, my new A-can has been closed for two weeks. I'm slowly getting my parameters. Slowly getting my parameters. Will it have a chance of opening? Yeah, if you can get your parameters in check, then it should open. Um, if you have certain... Watch your tank from a distance. Turn off the lights in the room and stand back and watch your fish and see if you have any fish nipping at it. Because it could be something that's constantly pestering it. It could even be something as simple as peppermint shrimp or taking the food away as soon as you try to feed the coral. Your, I, one of the best tricks I have for feeding corals is feed the reef first, wait 15 minutes, and then come back to the reef and see what else you can feed. Because now the food is in the water, the fish go crazy, you know, some of the fish poop, the stuff scatters all over the reef, and the corals start opening up. You know, if they haven't learned your feeding cycle, your feeding schedule, then you can go ahead and you can come back in, kill the flow of all your pumps in the tank with a timer so you don't forget, and then you can squirt food at those specific colonies, like acans you're trying to feed, and get them some nutrients as well. If they can just get a few pieces of mysis or a little bit of pellet food, or, or if they were getting fed with benarif, which is that liquid food that's planktonic in size, so it's so small they can inhale it, those are all good choices that you can use. And you, know, you can even come back five minutes later and hit them again with a little bit more food. You know, don't turkey base and go squirt really hard because it's like a jet of water hits it, the coral's going to retract even more. But if you can kind of like drizzle it over the coral and the coral's like, oh, thank you, and it grabs it and closes, you come back in five minutes, it might be open again, and you can drizzle a little bit more and it'll close. But you may have fish come to try and steal it. You could have a mandarin come over and try and get it. You could have a peppermint shrimp that will reach in its mouth and pull the food back out. And these things happen. So you have to kind of see what's happening. Why is the coral staying closed up? What has happened? Or is it just baking in too much light and it just can't stand it and hates that spot? That's another chance. I like acans down low myself in the tank. Um, Hala says, will there be a YouTube video of you speaking at Aquashella this past Chicago trip? I always enjoy watching and learning from you. That one was possibly filmed. I doubt they're releasing it. 
um, you know, that's going to be on George's channel. It's his show. And so he may have snippets, but I don't think he's releasing talks. I, I just don't think so. I haven't heard anything to make me think they are. Um, I was even thinking the Aquascape talk could possibly be a live stream. So uh, it's on my, my mental list of things I might cover. So, or at least pieces of it. Uh, we use some of your, your uh, pictures to explain things in uh, the aquascaping uh, conversation. And we specifically mentioned this per uh, I put his, his uh, thing on the screen here. So, Holla at your Reef Boy is another YouTube channel. And he's got a beautiful reef that he's had running for, I'd say, over a year because he had pictures from day one, six months, and then one year. And he's got a lot of like branching aquascape rock. So, a lot of room for things to flow through. And he had a very specific way of scaping so that the end view is incredible. But at the same time, it blocks your view of the rest of the reef from the end. You can only see the end. You know, you can see this one wall and everything happening, which is fantastic. It's covered in zoanthids. It's beautiful. But you can't see anything past it. So you got to come around the side of the tank to then see a whole new reef. And so we talked about that at, in the talk. Talked bad about you the whole time. Let's see. Um, Darth Simon says, have you ever dealt with polyclad flatworms? I think you're talking about the big ones. And yes, I've had them in my reef. I've had people bring them to my door and leave them on the doorsteps like here. And I took pictures of them. You're talking about the big ones that will eat snails and uh, it can kill clams. Those guys tend to exist in big tanks and very often are found inside the overflow box, which is really weird. Um, and so like anything that goes into the overflow box, snails or hermit crabs, goes to the bottom, it becomes a graveyard of empty shells because the polyclad just goes right over the top of it, pushes its stomach into the shell, goes in, gets the slug out, eats the whole thing, leaves an empty shell, and goes to the next one. So if you find anything like that in your tank, you're going to want to siphon it out with big tubing. I actually did a live stream la two weeks ago about flatworms. I kind of mentioned uh, what to do with different flatworms. That might be a, a good one for you to review. Rosano said his 120 just hit 10 years. That is awesome. Well done. Good job. 10-year-old tank. <laughs> UK Reef says, any plans for a tank upgrade in the future? Not this one. This is the dream tank. So if I, you know, I mean, there's things I can do to make it better. Like I could do something crazy like woodwork. Um, that would be an upgrade. Uh, but no, I don't want to do anything different with that tank. If I, I, I have a dream tank, you know, a, new, a new dream, this is the dream tank, but I have a new dream that I'd like to do that's probably a terrible idea, but um, right now I'm kind of thinking about replacing the Anemone Cube with a new, new aquarium. So that's kind of on my wish list right now. I just, same shape, nothing would change except it would be a new box, a new glass box, new stand. And I'm kind of on the fence on that one, you know, if I want to spend the money or not. But uh, I'm thinking about it. This, no, that tank is also going to be six years old. Ugh. Buddy has had his tank for 19 years. Wow. See, that's some magic silicone right there, people. <laughs> Let's see. Dean says, are you still using biopearls? Uh, you mean the biospheres from Coral View? I haven't run biopellets in a few years, so the answer is no. Uh, if you are using biopellets, you need to dose Microbacter 7 every week to give it more bacteria. Tyler just joined us whenever this was posted. Welcome. Let's see. Odile says, I'm having trouble with cyano. What do I use? Well, I have a... Okay, so I wanted to tell you guys about something. Let me open this up really quick, get it ready. This is so important for you guys to know. Uh, give me a second here to get this all sized up properly. We'll close this. I learned this trick the other day. I was watching some tutorials about the streaming software. So I'll take this, move it over here. And we'll go here. Okay. Miller's Reef. And see what happens okay so this is my website and ignore the top because I'm you know admin but you see where it says about me love if you click about me love you'll get a drop down menu and it'll say FAQs if you click FAQs I have so many 
uh, of these different topics answered, including cyanobacteria, how do I treat my tank? And here I go into it and explain exactly what you need to do and how I do it exactly so you can mimic my method and hopefully have the exact same success I do. I have a ton of FAQs about RODI systems because I sell them. Um, yeah, it's mostly RODI because I covered every possible question. <laughs> Anytime someone had a new question, it went on the FAQ page. But uh, cyanobacteria is right here. Carbon, how much you should use. And I showed the video that I discussed it. So that was a simple answer right there. It just takes you to the video. Um, silicone, what's safe to use. Uh, the skimmer, what's the proper bubble height. This is a topic I, I seem to address all the time. I always like it to be right at the base of the cup. Um, so that way the rest is just foaming up and going in. Um, another RO question. Acro eating, Acropore eating flatworms and the method of removing them. And there's Joe watering his reef. And then uh, finally, raising alkalinity using baked baking soda. So this, the FAQ section is great. So you go to About Me Live and you hit FAQs and you can go to those. It's funny. Uh, so like right here, I'd like to share this with you. And so I'm like, okay, I want to send, send them the Raising Alkalinity one, but there's no way to share that exact FAQ. I can only share milosreef.com slash facts. So that one's kind of a, I kind of wish that was handled differently by the software, but it is what it is. I just want to let you guys know this exists because maybe you weren't aware. And uh, I, I do add more. And if you say, hey, you need to add such and such, I probably will. So you can let me know. All right, back to the camera. What else we got here? Oh, Rayon says, why would you quarantine fish and not SPS and corals? Well, a coral doesn't need to be quarantined necessarily. I mean, yeah, there's a possibility, but if you're already inspecting it and you're dipping it and you've removed all the pests, it's ready to go in the tank. You know, if you were just keeping it in quarantine to observe for two or three weeks, you can, and you might even discover something you didn't want in your tank, and you, and you could call that a win. But it's kind of rare. You know, usually you catch whatever the problem was in the dip or as you're turning over in your hand and you're looking at it under a magnifying glass and you're really studying it and you can see what it is and scrape it off or you cut it off the frag plug like I said and you just have the coral itself and you plant that in your tank. Should be good to go. But for example, if the pest was acropora eating flatworms, you're not going to see that in a quarantine tank because they're so invisible. Um, and so I find that it's not really necessary. But back when I ran my quarantine tank, if I got new corals, I would just float them in there really quick and put them in there, and then I could leave them there for a week or two before they finally went in my tank. But it became sort of like a holding station, not a quarantine station. And I had to then, of course, at some point get my arm wet and pull them out and dip them and then put them in my, my main reef. So that's why. I just don't see the need for corals to go into a lengthy quarantine. But I can tell you this, public aquariums do that. Anything they get from anywhere, whether it was purchased or seized by customs, they uh, will put their corals and fish in separate tanks for 45 days before they go in their tank. But if you're going to keep corals in quarantine, you've got to maintain the water parameters, you've got to maintain the temperature, you've got to maintain the lighting. And it's a lot of work. So that's why. Uh, this one I don't know the answer to. Henrik, I do not know if any corals um, are shipped internationally by any companies here in the U.S. Um, I just don't know. Sorry. Luke says, how to transfer SPS corals to new tanks safely? Transport them, transfer them from your existing tank into the new one. You're basically going to be doing what I call a reset, and you're going to take all the livestock out of your tank and put it in something or in, in multiple somethings like holding bins, take some tank water and add that, add some power heads to keep flow in there, add a heater to maintain temperature, and then you're going to move the tank out of the way and put the new tank in place, get the substrate in there, add some water, add the rock in there, add some more water, start moving corals in there, add some more water, and then finally add the power heads and get the lights going and make sure everything's good and add a bunch of new salt water probably too because it, odds are you went with a bigger tank. But uh, it's just a tank transfer, so you're just moving things from one tank to the next. If they're across the room from each other, it's a little bit easier. You can set up the new tank in its new location. You can just walk things across. You might want to put towels down everywhere because you can be dripping left and right, but that should be it. And TBDH says, it's been years since I've watched the live stream, so welcome. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, getting filled in. We After what we took out a couple years ago, the tank is starting to fill in quite nicely. 
Martin, I want to thank you for the super chat. That was super nice of you. Did it twice. <laughs> um, do I dose any zoa or phytoplankton, uh, zo zoo or phytoplankton to my tank? No, actually I don't. I, um, I have dosed phyto in the past. It's such a big system that if I were to go that route, honestly, I just haven't seen the need. But if I were to go that route, I would use the, uh, what do they call it? Phyto Feast from Reef Nutrition, because it's very dense. It's a very dense culture, and you only need a little bit. And so I could probably put in a few tablespoons, and it would take care of my entire system. So that's the one I would recommend you know, for a big tank. Uh, the other choice, of course, is to grow your own phytoplankton, and I have an article about that on my website, where you can make your own, you can pour it in. And I used to, years ago, I was pouring it in, and I poured it in a lot. And it, it helped seem to keep the glass clean longer, which is interesting, an interesting side effect, and the reef seemed to do well. I had corals spawning and stuff. Maybe I should do it. But I just kind of felt like I didn't have the need. At one point, you know, I was getting the green on my glass on my new tank, and I would clean it off, and you'd see the green, like, dust go off into the water. I was like, oh, it looks like phytoplankton is hitting the water column. I'm making my own instead of having a bottle of green liquid. So I kind of just steered away from it. Maybe it's just, you know, as you, the longer you're in the hobby, you become a little bit more lazy. You know, the, the effort of maintaining phytoplankton and, and splitting the cultures and making sure everything's working and replacing what burns up, you know, it just kind of like it's one less thing to think about. And since I went to such a large tank, there's a lot of spinning plates happening behind me here. And I got to make sure they're all spinning properly so that none hit the floor. And so, you know, adding another thing on the side, having another tank somewhere in my house, it's not a really a big demand, you know, from you know, mentally I'm like, oh, I need six more plugs. <laughs> I need a spot. I got to make sure I stay on top of it. You know, but at the same time, I kind of want to. I see other people that have more than one tank, but I kind of, I technically have three. I have this one, the Anemone Cube, and then I have the Frag System. And the Frag System has been doing really badly. Now, if it was doing perfectly, then I'd probably say, yeah, let me take on another tank. <laughs> but I kind of feel like I'm already maxed out with what I got, plus my business, the work I do all day long. And so with that going on, um, adding another one into my schedule may not be the right choice. I travel a lot, I'm away from the tanks, and uh, so that's a valid concern that I have to, you know, I have to think it through to see, you know, responsibly, should I take this on or is that just being excessive? So I, I kind of try to keep things within reason, you know, limit it, kind of be balanced. Martin says he is watching from Scotland. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, okay, I cannot do this. Kurt says, can you ship to the UK? How much would it cost for a tank lid? First of all, that's a huge box. Even though it's skinny, it's big. And uh, I don't do tank lids. So there are companies that do, and you could reach out to them directly. I think there's one in Phoenix called Reef Gardens. It feels like that's the right name. So I would look up Reef Gardens, Tank Lids, Phoenix, Texas, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and see what Google spits out. And you could actually contact him and say, would you be willing to ship? And they, they might do it. It's possible. But yeah, I had someone recently ask me if I could make him a surround of black acrylic to go around the tank. And it was going to be, I think, six feet, five or six feet long and two feet wide and one foot tall. And it was just a U-shape with like a reinforcement. And I just, I was like, no. I mean, yes, I can glue that together. No, I cannot ship that. I can. It'll cost you 200 bucks in shipping alone because it's such a big box to get that thing to you safely. I said, I'd much rather you get somebody local to do that for you than to have me do it. So, um, you know, I, sometimes certain things are not great for shipping. And that one's very flimsy. And it wouldn't do well. It'd be much better to be built locally and you can put it in your car and drive home and put it on your tank and hopefully not scratch it. You know? Let's see. I don't know what this... Con Venom Blaster, what were you asking? Where you said, what about the multi-branch SPS? Maybe I can address that. Come back to me with your follow-up question. <laughs> G says... G says, I'm late to the show, but I brought the beer. I like you already. You should come to the show more often. Uh, the Fish Tank Barn says, I remember your monster leather coral. Yeah, that thing was amazing. I made a big mistake with that coral, um, and I'm going to share it with you. It's kind of a quick story. Oh, we're already over time. Um, so the leather coral grew really, really big, and when the 280-gallon leaked, I had friends come over, and we removed all the livestock from the tank as quickly as possible before the front glass just let go and flooded the house. And that coral was so big, it took two of us 
to lift it out at once, and we handed it, you know, we were standing on the walkboard, or no, we, didn't, we were standing on my table. We put the table in front of the tank to act like a walkboard. And we're standing on the table and we're hoisting out this very heavy coral, and we passed it off to someone that was standing on the floor, and he put it on his shoulder, and water was just gushing out of it. It was like a rain shower just pouring out of this coral. And what we were trying to do was have him stand on the scale, and we could find out how much it finally weighed. And he stood on the scale, and him and that coral was more than the scale could handle. We got the error message, like, forget it. And he was like, I know, I'm soaking wet, forget it. And we put it in this giant trash can. And I was stubborn in that I did not... I felt like I could keep it, which was a terrible decision on my part. I grew it from nothing. It was massive. It was beautiful. It was a showpiece. And I thought, well, when I get a new tank, I'm going to put it in there. I don't, you know, it's my baby. <laughs> but what I should have done was call the, the Dallas World Aquarium with their 1500 gallon systems and say, have I got a coral for you, which would then be alive to this day. It would have been grown from fragging. You know, it wasn't taken from the ocean. It was actually a magna frag you know, that I came home with in my suitcase. And I grew it into this beautiful thing and I could be visiting it multiple times a year inside their exhibits. And they probably would have taken it from me because, uh, you know, I had a good relationship with that place. And it was huge. And having a huge colony inside public aquariums is actually pretty desired. And I just made a big, big mistake holding on to it and saying I'm just going to keep it and put it back in my tank because as I was looking in the trash can, you know, that it was in, I had a whole bunch of live rock. I put a heater in there. I put power heads in there and it was under the lights. I kept thinking, well, when I pick this thing up and put it in my tank, it's going to do that shower thing again. It's going to be super stressed. And I'm going to put it in the tank, the new one, and water's going to flow across it and it's going to kill everything else I own because it's so pissed off. I mean, how could it not? It's just... It's a terrible plan. And so I was really worried. What am I going to do with this coral? How am I ever going to get in there safely? Do I put it in first and wait weeks? You know, what am I going to do? And while I'm debating all this and still trying to solve the tank problem of who's going to rebuild my tank or am I buying a new one or anything, it was just starting to die. And it was getting worse and worse. It was getting smaller. It was shrinking. <clears throat> so I contacted my local club and I said, does anyone have a quarantine tank or like a semi-reef tank with nothing in it that we can put this in so we can get some decent circulation and hopefully keep it from dying. And one club member says, yeah, Mark, uh, I've actually got the exact setup. It won't talk, you know, it won't be toxic to anything else I own. You know, it won't, you know, release anything and kill other things because it's its own sump. It's like, I can literally do this. And so I drove it all the way out to him and, you know, we put it in the tank and, you know, it looked terrible. And then I thought it'll do better. You know, it, it'll, it'll come around because it's a leather coral. And after a few weeks, I contacted him and said, so what's going on with it? You know, what's the status? And he said, oh, that thing died. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. He says it was floating across the surface like a cork. And I was like, it could float? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I cut off a few pieces hoping to maybe make some new frags. Nothing survived. I'm like, uh. So you see, it was a huge mistake. And I shouldn't have... Uh, I shouldn't have been such an only child, and I should have just called the aquarium and said, hey, I've got this, can I bring it to you tomorrow? And I should have brought it to them the very next day. I should have just made the drive, gone an hour there, dropped it off, let them put it in quarantine for 45 days, and then, uh, you know, it would be alive to this day. So that was kind of unfortunate. It was a sad ending to a beautiful creature that gave me a lot of joy for, a you know, for six years. And uh, I, a lot of people would see pictures of it online, like... Uh, the fish tank barn said you know because they used to post pictures a lot on the forums and it would always be updates on that coral and people really liked it so i was sad to lose it thanks for bringing up a sad topic let's see um okay let's talk about phosphates Rosano says is 0.26 a good phosphate parameter i have some green hair algae starting in the tank 0.26 is a little bit high you actually want to be lower than that the goal is 0 0.03 and 0.26 will fuel algae growth. You're seeing some hair algae grow in your tank. Your tank may be young. I have this feeling it's a new setup since you're asking this question. So you're going to want to head, make sure that you're not running your lights too long and you want to have a cleanup crew in there and you're going to want to lower your phosphates. Get them down. Get them down to less than 0.1. That would be best. Um, Venom Blaster says, is reef chili a good food for vibrant corals? <clears throat> There's a lot of different foods on the market you could use. I don't know any specific one that's going to make them vibrant, you know, make them super colorful. Um, I would just say try different brands and see what works best for your tank. 
uh, be careful if you go over if you overdose on foods you can end up creating other issues like cyanobacteria in your tank so kind of you have to find the sweet spot but the coloration of corals comes from them being healthy and happy and mature and uh, good lighting good flow and good water parameters that's where the color I mean they're naturally colorful so if they're pale something's not right in your system you want to correct that and odds are I mean uh, I'm Probably not food related unless you're starving the tank. The ultra low nutrient systems kind of make corals more pale or pastel, and it's kind of right on the cusp of killing the tank. You know, they're right on the razor's edge of going too far toward ultra low nutrients. I prefer nutrients. You know, I like to have some in my tank. I like to have fat fish. I like to have corals that are kind of dense and beefy. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to achieve the, the picturesque photo necessarily. I'm trying to just grow something relatively naturally. Wall Street says, if I send you a design for a sump, are you able to build it? That's possible. I'll take a look. I don't copy other companies, so uh, you know, keep that in mind. But yeah, send over your pictures. You can. What you can do is send me an email today. Go to my website, click on Contact Us, and that'll start the conversation. I'll reply, and then you can attach pictures, because you can't attach pictures to the first message. And now you can send me sketches or drawings or whatever you've got, and I'll take a look at it. Um, Kev says, I have a top-down shallow reef tank. Can you recommend a coral to fill the gaps between my tabling acros and plating montipora? Mm -hmm. Like soft corals? Or, I mean, with a shallow reef, one of the things that a lot of times people like, rather than corals, would be other things you look down at from above, like clams. And so perhaps putting clams between those species, you know, between the acro and the monte would be very pretty. Um, you can have some of the rock, you can have some down on the substrate. I know it's shallow, so there's only so much space you have to work with. That comes to mind. Um, I also like recordias. Uh, those are beautiful. And recordia is kind of like dirty water, SPS like clean water, so that's kind of a trick. But you could feed them. So maybe recordias would be a good coral. Um, they don't tend to be, you know prolific they don't tend to sting things like other corals would so maybe that's a good choice those are a couple come to mind maybe consider some of those carlos says do you prefer cube and enemies to rectangles no actually i like rectangles cubes are nice i mean they have their their perfect footprint and they fit almost anywhere but the big rectangle gives you the long swim run for your fish and i do like that by the way, I wanted to mention that with this video, I thought I'd try something different. So I put a shield on the back of the tank so it wouldn't light up the water tank. So this wouldn't be so blown out and it still looks terrible. <laughs> it still looks bad. Um, I just wish it looked better for you guys. And on that note, Reef King says your tank looks nice. So thank you for the compliment. Dean says, can you recommend something for internal parasites? Uh, you're going to need some kind of a medicated food, and I would start there. Search for medicated fish food and see what you find in Google. I'm not a fish disease guy. I really don't have the knowledge to help you guys. I almost tell everyone else just, I mean, I pretty much always say, go to somebody else. Uh, I don't have an answer for you there. But I think there's something called Medic that has been popular, but I don't know enough about it. I was actually talking to the Polyp Labs guys about it, but... Uh, there are other foods on the market. I'm trying to think. But just Google saltwater medicated foods and see what you find. Or medicated fish foods. And I think you'll, you'll come across some things that you can try out. Reef King says, do you think a bigger tank is harder? Well, it's more expensive and it's more work. But uh, it also absorbs issues that smaller tanks can't. So we don't you know, we, as in people with big tanks, don't have big parameter swings typically. It takes a while for something to get out of whack, but then it takes a lot of effort to get it back in line too. So that's why I always recommend testing your water weekly to see where you're at. And like I was saying, I haven't been really great about pulling out the test kits, but I'm looking at the Trident every, you know, daily. I'm looking at the Mindstream every other day. I mean, I'm constantly looking at the numbers that are being given to me on the fly. You know, the latest results, the latest alkalinity, the latest magnesium, latest potassium, latest temperature, salinity, it's all there on these two devices. So it, it makes, it negates my need to pull out test kits necessarily if I can believe the, the values I'm being given. The uh, things it doesn't test is phosphate and nitrate. And those are important ones that a lot of us care about because we don't like algae in our tanks. 
Devin says, I just got a, a rainbow chalice for my two-year tank anniversary. I love that. That's awesome. I saw the most beautiful coral at Aquashella. <clears throat> see if I can find this one picture to share with you guys. This will take a second. Um, it'll end up in the video. So I saw, uh, where is it? I saw a lot of nice stuff. I, yeah, I'll, I'll show you guys in the video. I don't want to spoil it. This is a lot of, oh, <laughs> got too far. I went to Shed Aquarium. Um, so this coral, let's see if I can make this bigger. I don't know if this is going to pivot for you guys. Yeah, it looks like it is. That coral right there, let me hide this. That coral right there was easily six inches across, maybe seven inches across, and they said it was pissy. <laughs> they said it doubles in size. That thing was fantastic, and if you can see that little price tag behind there, it's a tight. It's not an A can, but it's got a name with A can in the beginning. <clears throat> like I don't know what it is, but this big beast, A canophilia or something like that was $2,000. So I was like, that's beautiful. No, I'm not buying it. Uh, I, I was really blown away by that coral. It was gorgeous. And I saw more people posting pictures of it. And I was like, did you see the price tag? Because they're all like, oh, that thing's really pretty. But a lot of people missed the price tag. And I was like, wow. And you know, I probably could have made an offer, but you know, my offer would have been like 200. <laughs> and there was no point, no reason to offend the vendor. <clears throat> it was beautiful. And you have to have a spot for a coral that big, you know, so I didn't. Mike B, finally for joining. Thank you for joining us finally. He said he forgot about our stream. Let's see. Oh, my back is bothering me. <laughs> I'm just reading the comments, guys. Oh, this one's a hard one. Uh, the boss man says, what is the best percentage of light, blue, white, red, for SPS? It's really not the channels and the percentages, it's the look. Uh, if you're trying to have a daylight where it looks like the sun is shining on your reef, you're going to use more white and less blue and red and the other color, and UV and the colors that are available. If, you, um, if you're wanting more of the blues, you're going to be turning up the violets and the blues and turning the whites down. But I have an entire video about lighting that I really would recommend you watch. And it's not as long as the live stream. <laughs> and in that video, I talk about the duration of how long your light should run per day. And I also mentioned how the sun, you know, right here, works its way across the reef throughout the day. And when it's at the high point at noon, it's blasting the coral reefs in the ocean. But when it's in the morning, it's just giving it a little bit of light from the side. You know, so it's gradually adding it till it gets to high noon, which is a big intense amount of light for let's say two to four hours and then it's you know the sun is moving because the earth is rotating and so the they get less light and less light and it's just kind of being lit from the side again so <clears throat> when you're trying to keep your sps corals happy you want to think about how long should high noon be so rather than having the lights go on stay on 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 on, on and turn off i actually prefer the bell curve where it comes on goes up goes up it's high, stays high, comes down, comes down, comes down. And you get that bell shape, which kind of matches exactly how the sun moves over a reef. So that's what I recommend. Now, percentage, that's going to vary with every person you ask, including me. Uh, I tend to run my anemone cubes lighting around 80%. So that is the maximum light that is hitting the tank of all the channels combined. It's 80%. And then I pick the colors I like to fit within that range and into that bell curve. So, you know, when the light starts in the beginning of the day, it might be 17%, then it goes to 23%, then it's 35%, then it's, you know, 54%, and then finally it's 80 and then it goes back down to 54%, and then 33%, and then 17%, and then zero. So that would be how I handle it. Dwayne, who has a beautiful SPS reef and all SPS corals, he was using the cheap Chinese black boxes, and he was running all the channels at 100% every single day. And he just blasted his tank with light, and his corals grew like crazy. And every single year, he took those lights down, opened them up, replaced every single diode, <laughs> which took 40 minutes of light fixture. And he would replace, he'd buy all the LEDs himself, and he'd solder them all together, and he'd put the light together and put it back on the tank for another year of 100% on all channels. And that's, you know, remarkable that that worked. 
but the light wouldn't last long term at that rate. It would just overheat. That's why you had to keep replacing the emitters. So there's a person who uses 100%. I'm saying use less. There are going to be people out there that tell you you need 5% white and you need 55% blue. Uh, it's more a choice, a preference. You know, you have to go with what looks good to your eye and also that continues to grow corals. I can tell you this, the more blue you use, the more colorful it'll be, but the slower the growing. And the more white you use, the more growth you'll get, but it'll be less vivid. So, for example, if you could run more of the whites during the daytime while you're at work, and then shift into the blues for the afternoon, evening, and nighttime, you can then enjoy the reef at night, but you gave them the big growth during the daytime. And that's what I do with my reef. My metal halides turn on starting at 1 o'clock, and they are running 10,000 Kelvin, which is white. It looks like the sun is shining on my reef. And they get about two hours a day of that sunlight, and then I switch to the 20K or 20 Kelvin look, which is blue, for another four or four and a half hours. I basically run my lights for about six and a half hours each on my tank all day long. So that's what I'm saying. Watch the video. It'll make a lot more sense then. But that was just the quick summation for you. Uh, Fisher says, how would you go about getting coral for a huge tank like a thousand gallon? I would contact some of the vendors uh, that you're considering buying from and tell them what you're doing and tell them what you're looking for. Like, you're, I want big corals, I want big gorgonians from Florida. And tell them, you know, kind of have an idea of what you have in mind, what you're trying to create. What kind of biotope do you want? And once you know that, then you can uh, see what kind of pricing you'll get. And you may be surprised. It may not be as bad as you're expecting because your order is unique to what they normally sell. They're normally selling one inch frags. So if you tell them I'm trying to populate a big reef tank, I, I want it to look like this for the first six months, and then after, you know, I'm going to gradually switch into this, you know, you can discuss. And I think that would be the best way. Um, you may even want to travel to different places, uh, places in the U.S. that sells corals, and it's essentially called cherry picking, and you pick out what you want, and that way, and then you fly it home. You know, you bring it home as cargo. <clears throat> So that might be your best bet for bringing home the exact things you really want, rather than ho hoping for a salesman to pick out the things you're wanting. I mean, salesmen will do that. They'll they'll set aside their best corals. They'll send they'll take pictures of them and they send them to their big clients, and then the client says yes, yes, no, no, no. You know, so that could be something you could do. Um, most of us tend to grow things from small, and even with a big tank. A thousand gallons, two thousand gallons. You're gonna need something a little bit bigger up front because it's gonna be boring otherwise. You're just looking at a pile of rocks. And if you can't see the thing from three to five feet away, it's invisible. So that's why I was suggesting gorgonians, because they're big and they move in the flow and they're pretty. You can add leather corals, you can add cold coral. I mean, again, these are all softies, they're all easy corals, but they fill in the spaces nicely. And then as the tank becomes more mature and better able to handle a bioload, you can then start removing those and planting new corals, usually the size of a fist or greater, so it doesn't seem to be such a slow process. But like anything, like planting a garden, you gotta wait a while for everything to grow, and that's what's gonna happen with that tank. <clears throat> Mervin, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. <laughs> USMC reefer, now I know who you are. That was hilarious. <laughs> so, <laughs> she ran up to me. I told this story on uh, Facebook recently. She ran up to me and she said, let's take a picture together to make my husband jealous. And without skipping a beat, I was like, let's do it. <laughs> so we were taking this picture and it, her daughter was there and she's holding the phone up. You know, she's like, we're going to do this selfie. So she's holding it up and, she, and we're all posed. And she hits the button and instead of it taking a picture, it says 10 on the screen. Nine, eight. It was hilarious. So I believe I shared that one on my Instagram, but if I didn't, I shared it on, on Facebook. But it was really funny because we actually made a bunch of silly faces as it was counting down. And then when we got to one, of course, I smiled with a picture. Well, <laughs> I was smiling and her and her daughter made this ridiculous face and it was hilarious. And then she shared it, which was great. I saw it and I was like, this is awesome. And I shared it myself. And I, it was funny because she said, you made us look bad. And I was like, I know how a countdown works. <laughs> Once you get to one, you smile. <laughs> it was really funny. So no, it was great meeting you. Uh, and yeah, that was a funny moment. All right. Yeah, she only knew me by my voice. 
Let's see. Ken says, can you get 12 foot sheets of acrylic? Yeah, but what would I do with it? Nothing, I can't even lift it. So I would never do that. But yeah, the suppliers I have have everything I need, any size I want. I think the biggest sheets I've ever got were five feet by 10 feet for some big sumps I had to build. But 12 feet, no. My back already hurts just thinking about it. Uh, let's see. Michael asks, are you still using the export NO3 brick? No, I took that out probably a year ago. Let's see. Blinky Fish says, does safety stop have any effect on white spot if a fish happens to be carrying it? When you say white spot, my brain is saying uh, you're talking about ick but you may be talking about something else. I'm not a fish disease guy. I do know it says on the package, do not put a fish covered in ick in safety stop. So that's as much as I can answer on that question. Uh, Tyler, I might try it, I don't know. We One time I had a photographer here to take pictures of my reef and we put black velvet on the back of the tank and it really freaked out the fish because that was not what they're used to seeing all day long. And so for me to put up something that actually blocks the back, I'd actually rather like maybe put a curtain back there. Uh, really what I want is to just film it in beautiful 4K and then paste it behind me as a, as a green screen. I think that would look so much better and it would be perfect. So um, we just have to wait for that software to happen. In the meantime, what you get is this. But I, I tried this today just to see if it would make a difference. Also, it would have helped if I'd cleaned the glass. My glass is, needs to be cleaned today. Let's see. Keith says, have you ever had any experience with the balling method of dosing? No, I haven't. Uh, I know that's popular in Europe and uh, it is migrating here into the US through the company Fauna Marin, which is German based. And uh, no, I have not done it. But balling has been around now for about 15 years, maybe longer. Uh, it was, I became aware of it about 15 years ago. So I have no experience with that one. Uh, Marcus says, do you think the powder blue tang was a unique experience or was is that normal? My guess is it's completely normal, but uh, I don't know. I only did the one powder blue tang and it, I think I got it with the tank I bought. That's why I had it. I would not normally buy that fish. Uh, it's beautiful and you know I've looked at powder blues, powder browns, you know they're gorgeous, but I've never actively said, let me go buy one. You know, it never occurred to me. But when I bought that tank, it came with you know rock and fish and and uh, the, the horrible sump. <laughs> It had a horrible sound. And the uh, the powder blue was so pretty. I was like, oh my god, I love that I have this fish. It was great. I never replaced it. Never got another one. And I don't know that I would. And since I have a leather in my tank, I probably won't because I wouldn't want to see happen again what happened last time. Could it have been a freak occurrence? I don't know. But I have a feeling it was nibbling. Hey, Dwayne's here, everybody. Everyone clap. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Spike says, have you heard good or bad about Tropic Marin Carbo Calcium? Actually, I just heard about that product. I haven't heard good or bad. I've just heard about it. It was new. Oh, let me talk about one more new thing that came to Aquashella. So this is something new called Aquachar. And it is a type of carbon that we are not used to using. Um, it is not granulate activated carbon. It is actually wood that has been baked, like let's say in a kiln. And it's a completely different method. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. But uh, <laughs> it was sent to me to try out. I talked to one hobbyist who has a lot of experience and his response was, I am not putting that in a reef tank. And I was like, oh, so uh, I don't know. Um, one of the things they did in their booth at the show was they had a vial where they put in something that uh, made the vial have low pH. And they took one little nugget of that carbon and dropped it in and the pH rose instantly. And the, for the freshwater community, apparently this helps buffer, or I say buffer, bring up their pH. It absorbs something and it, it makes the pH come up. And apparently it's something that can last and work for uh, three to six months before you have to change it. Because it's it's doing something. It's, it's becoming its own biological filter. And it works great in a reactor. But, you know, the whole change in the pH thing, because I was thinking, oh, I'll put it on the frag system. <laughs> and then he made that one, you know, my friend made that one comment, I'm like, oh. So I don't know, I'm rethinking my thought. Maybe I'll use less of it and see what happens, see if it changes anything. I don't know. 
that tank really just needs a redo. Oh, thank you. Uh, Acanophilia. Yeah. Flash can says it could be up to two feet in diameter max. Wow. That's very big. Let's see. Tim says, have you considered doing the GoPro top-down reef cam idea? I haven't. Um, I don't own a GoPro. I just don't own one. And the other part is it has to have a wire connected to the, the live stream computer. And I think a GoPro is standalone. And I don't know if it would Wi-Fi signal through the water to the computer successfully. So no, I haven't. I have a, no way to test it or try it or anything. So no, I have not. Um, I thought about just putting a stationary one of my floater boxes and taking one of these webcams and stick it in there and see what it does. But uh, it's a fixed thing. It's not like you're going to get this amazing view. It's just going to be like, whatever. Uh, I haven't done anything. <laughs> Vivid Creative Aquatics is here. Late as usual. Yep, you, uh, you missed most of it. We talked about you really bad the whole time. Um, and then the next person asked, asked is, uh, Spike says, I'm planning a new build. Should I go with a refugium or not? I can't decide. I actually love refugiums. I think they're a really good benefit to the reef tank, and every tank I have has a refugium. But, you know, nowadays people are using turf scrubbers, and they're using algae reactors, so they're kind of negating the need of one. Matter of fact, I've heard if you use a turf scrubber, your refugium won't survive. So you're almost going to have to choose which direction you want to go with your filtration. Do you have any euphilia? Oh, yeah. These are hammer corals, and there's frog spawn right there. Uh, I don't have any torch. Torch. I did try one torch once. They have big, long sweepers that sting, and uh, it didn't survive. It was in the back of my reef. Do you think, do you think having a mixed reef is harder than an SPS tank? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think SPS is more straightforward. You have one thing you have to do, and it just works. And when you put in a mixed reef, you're dealing with different water parameters, uh, different flow, different lighting intensity. You can get it, you know, if you did no SPS, it'd be even easier to maintain the tank. And as you add some of a little bit of everything, it becomes more complicated, both on parameters, on lighting, on flow, and even on chemical warfare between the different species that don't normally live together in nature. Tim says, for a big tank, uh, <clears throat> one idea is to get five frags of the same coral and place them all next to each other, and they will fill in the area nicely and, and quickly. I totally agree, and I forgot to mention that. So you can do that. You can, you know, let's say you had a Milka coral, which is a parietes, and you could plant like 15 or 20 of those little frags all on a rock instead of one twig waiting for it to do something, and they'll all make their little clusters, and they'll all grow into each other, and it becomes really nice. So that is a great point. Thank you for mentioning that, Tim. <clears throat> Uh, Jason says, is your Nassau a blonde? Yes, it's a blonde a Nassau tang. I've had it for two th since 2004. And uh, her size is equitable for this aquarium, but I feel like if she was in the ocean, she'd be twice the size. Uh, GMAX says, can we look at your fuge? Yes. Let me move this here for you guys. Let's see what this looks like. Is this camera plugged in? Oh, my arm's in the way. I was like, I don't see it. So, there you go. That's the refugium right now. I can move this a little bit closer. Hang on, I'm going to spill my coffee here. Why is the wire so short? So, this is all feather calerpa. And there's, I'm trying to kill the, oh, that bright white. It's not really working. But, and it's got the reactor media in the bottom, and there's a lot of detritus in there. It's getting to the point where I have to start cleaning it out. But it's doing pretty well. And then behind it, you can see the skimmer, and you can see the Clarisy with the brand new roll I'm about to install, and the calcium reactor, and then some cooling fans that never come on, and dosing pumps. All right. Michael asks a question I don't know the answer to. What is everyone's thought on the Red Sea paper test? So somebody tell me what the paper test is. That's a new one to me. <clears throat> hey, Trevor, I'm glad uh, that... Th Trevor was an order I shipped to the UK, 
and he ordered some filter socks and I put them in the world's tiniest box and I shipped them over super fast and he's already got them and they're working out great. So thanks very much for the, the comment. Fisher says, what are your thoughts on a predator reef tank? Well, typically a predator tank doesn't have reef stuff in it. It's just predators because reaching into a predator tank puts yourself, the hobbyist, at risk. Reaching in and getting stung, being bit, um, uh, those are the two things I would be worried about. I guess there's other things that probably could happen. So a lot of times it's just a bunch of rock and predators. And uh, it's even hard to put in cleanup crews because they all become snacks. So I've never run a predator tank. The one thing I got that was semi-predator was a puffer. And it, it ate one of my clownfish. It ate the face off of a clownfish. And so I named that fish Murderer and gave it away. A lot of people like predator tanks. They like them because... It's very interactive. You drop in something for them to eat and chomp. And you're just like, oh, that was awesome. Do it again. Do it again. And, you know, you can have eels. You can have scorpion fish. Uh, you can have, uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of different things, that lionfish and so forth. But they're, like I said, when it comes time to clean the tank or rearrange the rock work, whatever, you have to be extra careful that you don't get stung or hurt. It's just something to keep in mind. So I just choose not to do it. Um, the Lone Aquarius is here. Hello. Everyone's sneaking in late. I should do these streams later in the day. Um, have you ever thought of... Okay, so. <laughs> Kev says, have you ever thought about keeping a top-down tank, like a rigid pond style? Actually, that's kind of the next dream tank. I like the idea of a tank this size, but taller. So seven feet long, three feet front to back, four feet tall. And I'd like to have it sitting on the floor. And I want to be able to look down in the tank and reach into the tank and enjoy the view all the time from above. But then the walls would be way down low. Um, they'd be here so I could actually sit in my chair and look down at the reef at the perfect angle and still see the corals. But then when I stand up and walk up to the tank, I can just like look down in there and I can see how everything looks. And I would have a button that kills the flow in the, uh, the display for like, I don't know, three to five minutes, and I could just stop the flow, enjoy the beautiful view. I'd have the lights on some kind of a pulley system that's mechanical, so it just lifts out of my way and doesn't block my view, and I can just enjoy the reef, and then when I'm done, the lights come back down, the flow resumes, and the reef keeps going. And I would love that kind of a tank, and I think that would be awesome and completely different. One person said that the only way to clean the glass is on your hands and knees, and that's not wrong. <laughs> that is a thing I'd have to consider, but... I just, I think that'd be really cool instead of having one that you have to stand in front of, having one down low to the floor where you can enjoy it from above for the most part. And then, you know, you could come up to the side of it with children and they could see it right at their eye level. That would be awesome. I, I'd like to do that. That's something I'd like to do. <clears throat> uh, have you talked about the Mindstream getting a lot of flack on Reef to Reef? Um, price point or lack of brand ambassadors? Uh, no, I'm not aware of what's going on in Reef to Reef. I, I'm almost never on forums these days. But uh, the Mindstream is new technology and there's new adopters. You know, it, it's finally released to the public and they are going to continue to fine tune it. They've been working on it for years. They want it to be a success. And uh, so whatever they're doing, it's, it's going to change week to week and get better and better. Um, for the most part right now, it's already doing really quite well for me. Uh, I did have to replace mine with a new one, but the new one has been bulletproof, which makes me think that I was right, that whatever I had had a problem. It was a lemon, you know, just something happened in production. And so, so far, so good, you know, fingers crossed. But uh, it, I don't know about the flack you're describing, and, uh, you know, it's kind of everything. I mean, no matter what, I saw someone post pictures of their brand new Apex, and it had the four probes, brand new in the package, they hadn't pulled them out yet, and they had salt around each of the plastic caps, and someone said, do these look used to you? Because I, I feel like I, I bought something new, they should be new. And I just saw that, and I was like, wow, really? Because, you know, I mean, I know we want to be careful, we want to make sure we're not being ripped off or whatever, but that's normal. I mean, that just happens. That's part of storage. It just does things like that. You know, it's just a little bit of salt creep around the rubber cap that's keeping the tips of the probes wet. That's all it is. And everyone said, normal, 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 normal. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Clean it off. You're ready to go. So it was fine. But I'm, I don't know. There's, it's like everyone's second guessing everything these days to the extreme. 
And maybe it's because we've had so much fake news, we don't believe anyone anymore. Maybe that's the problem. And I think it's becoming to the point now where you need absolute proof before you can move forward with a decision, maybe. But uh, I do think Mindstream is doing their best to meet what the consumer needs, and they're working on it. And, you know, if they were just like, oh, whatever, you know, if it was like bland answers where it seemed like they didn't care, that would be a different thing. But that's not the case. Uh, Bill says, can you explain why you're not using biopellets anymore? I, I was trying something different. I've been trying different things for some time now to see what other products do. I mean, I get it. You know, you could use the same thing forever and never change anything and say, yeah, it works. And I just have chosen to, I said, you know, I did biopellets for three years. I thought, okay, let me try... Uh, the BioBrick, you know, I want to see what that did, and that didn't work. I said, let me try Nopox, and you know, it's kind of hit or miss on that one. You know, people have mentioned the Turf Scrubber, you know, and so that's kind of on my list of, mm, maybe I want to go that direction next. It's just kind of nice to try different things out over time and see how they respond, how they work. Spike says that, um, and he's replying to Chris, talking about mixing up different dry powders all into one solution to add to the tank. Typically, we usually don't pre-mix things all together, other than salt mix that has all the ingredients. But, uh, like, if a product is being sold, you know, A, B, C, D, we tend to dose A and B and C and D at the proper rates, rather than adding it all up into one. Um, anything you want to combine, I would, I would say I have no idea if you can, and I would say contact the vendor, you know, the actual people making the product, and say, what can I put together in the same jar? Um, what are the side effects? What are the risks? And that way you'll know for a fact what's good or what's bad. Okay, i got to wrap this thing up soon. Um, we are over two hours. Marcus, thank you for the super chat. That was really nice of you, and I appreciate it. Tim, I hope you enjoy your Mindstream. I think you'll like it a lot. I think... Uh, it's, it's nice to have something that gives you updates in your tank every 15 minutes. And it's Wi-Fi based, you know, and it's uh, connected to your cell phone, so you can just pull out your phone wherever you are. I was at Aquashello looking at my numbers. <laughs> it was very, very convenient. Uh, Keith says, what are your thoughts on a huge refugium? Huge, like matching the display tank and no skimmer. Okay, so a, pro a protein skimmer has a job to remove docks from the water, dissolve organic compounds. And it also is driving off CO2. And recently Sanjay has a mine stream on his tank and he turned off the skimmer to see if the oxygen level would change in the tank because he thought it would drop because there's less bubbles. But what ended up happening, if I remember this correctly, and if one of you guys is Sanjay's friend and you saw it, you can correct me here in the chat, his CO2 went up. And then Craig Bingham, who just got the Aquarius of the Year award from Asna, he did the whole sciencey thing with the formulas and the equations, and he explained how the protein skimmer's job is so important to help knock out the CO2 and add, and it doesn't like add oxygen, but it like drives off CO2. That's about as much as I could comprehend. The conversation was way over my head, and uh, that was pretty interesting. So, a lot of times, when you think about like chemically being treated, and they say turn off your skimmer. So you turn it off. I've always wondered, well, what does that do to the oxygen level? You've removed the bubbles. You've removed the skimmer. But, and so a lot of times the product, you know, well, I mean a lot of times, the product said, turn off the skimmer and add an air stone to the display tank to add air. And now I'm wondering, is it adding air or is it pushing off CO2? Because the more CO2 you have in the tank, the lower your pH. By driving off the CO2, the pH can stay up. So... That's a unfinished thought process still in my head. It's interesting, though. Let's see. Oh, uh, let me come back to this. So having a refugium only, no skimmer, you're not driving off CO2. You would have to drive off CO2 another way. Uh, you might have to use a CO2 scrubber. Um, the water flowing through the teeth and down the drain mixing with air does help remove some of it. Having a system with only refugium has filtration could work. Um, there are people that run tanks with no sumps, no refugiums, no skimmers, and, and their stuff looks pretty. So there are a lot of ways to accomplish the same thing in this hobby. Uh, they're just, they have different needs. I was watching a, an Instagram video from Inappropriate Reefer yesterday, and the guy had a, I think he said it was a 13-gallon tank. It was pretty. It didn't look small. I mean, it was a nice size. And the guy had no sump. He had nothing. It was just a tank on top. He had some corals in there. And he said he just does a water change once a week. That's it. There's no filtration. Just some power heads, change water every week. And that was all it got. 
and he doesn't dose anything because the water changes are giving enough supplements for what his corals needed. It wasn't a high-end SPS tank, but it was, um, you know, a nice little reef. And he was doing it with water changes. No refugium, no skimmer, no reactors, no dosing, no controller, just two powerheads. I'm like, wow, it was pretty. You might check it out. Um, Kulinu, <laughs> not sure how to say that, uh, said that his mom, his, her, her mom, said uh, that she bought some of that carbon for her big outdoor goldfish that she puts in a tub for the winter. Yeah, um, for fresh water, for ponds, I think that carbon I was showing you, the aquachar, is probably super beneficial. I'm not sure how it's going to uh, equate to the saltwater hobby. It's, I think some people are going to have to try it and see what it does and uh, create some feedback, you know, give us some information on what's safe, what's not, you know, is it a good choice for us? Should it stay in the freshwater market? I don't know. It's new to us. Um, there's some information on their website, uh, but it's, mm, I just don't know. <laughs> and uh, it's something we need to find out. <laughs> yeah, I did name that fish murderer. All right, let's see. Hey, we're almost at the end of the chat. Let's see. Has anyone ever been stung by a fox face? Mine eats out of my hand, but she can get spooked and flare her spines. Well, I haven't been stung because I don't have one because they can sting. But I do know others that have, and they said it felt like a bee sting. And so feeding out of your hand is good. I would say think proactively, like put your food at the end of the tank, you know, your hand with the food, so she comes to it so she's not spooked. Don't just come down from above and say, here's your food, because if another fish swims up, the spooking can happen, and you might get stung, and that would hurt. <laughs> the question was, I'm curious what it feels like. Please don't be that guy. You know, the one that says, I've never been hit by a car before, so I'm going to go stand in front of a car and see what that feels like. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, just be glad you haven't been stung. That's a good thing. Assume that it hurts. It's a pretty good assumption, and uh, hope it never happens. That would be my recommendation. All right, uh, that person's saying goodbye. Uh, the boss man asks, uh, do you have any input on the best food for SPS corals? Well, honestly, the best food is to feed the fish and let the fish poop all over your reef and they will feed your corals. But I've really been impressed with Benner Reef because you can use it way too much and still not create chaos in your tank. You don't end up with nutrient issues. You don't have phosphate spikes. You don't have cyanobacteria happening. It's a product that uh, I tried out probably nine months ago. And I can just mix it up in a cup. You have to let it sit for five minutes for the bacteria to awaken because it's all dormant. And then you pour it in your tank after you fed your reef and keep the skimmer off for, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. And all that plankton-sized food will be absorbed by your corals. The fish will swim around like crazy wanting to eat it, but they can't because there's nothing biteable. It's, it's so fine. And it feeds everything. So you can feed your acans and you can feed your euphilias and it can feed your clam and um, it can feed... Uh, all the LPS, the hammer corals and so forth, you know, the uh, calastria, uh, which we call trumpet corals, all those can eat, but all the SPS corals can eat it too because they all have tiny mouths, so it's perfect. All right. Michael says, can you tell me when my Nero 5 guard are going to arrive? Um, I believe I shipped those to you a few days ago and sent you some tracking number information, so check your, your emails. I believe your name was already satisfied. So they went out the next day after being order was placed. Uh, Kev says, I've almost fell into my top down tank a few times while cleaning. <laughs> Got to be careful. Get your footing. But yeah, it's nice. You're just dealing with cleaning the, the walls. You're not having to deal with cleaning the front glass. Yeah, the whole lagoon style, it, it is appealing. It's something I've, I've always considered would be worth doing, but I've not done that. Shane says, would you always do sand in your aquarium? Yes. What about the litter box? Some say it creates. Don't care. I love sand in a reef tank. I don't like a reef tank without sand. Whenever I see a reef tank without sand, I said, when are you going to add the sand? And, uh, you know, they just, ah, ha, ha. Yeah, Marcus saw that video. Not only did that guy, <laughs> not only did that guy only do the water changes, he feeds his fish with chopsticks. I was like, that is awesome. I was, I laughed. I was like, that was brilliant. I did not expect that. I've never seen anyone feed their fish with chopsticks. That was great. <laughs> uh, 
What are your thoughts on Phosphate RX? I have a whole video. I love the stuff. I've been using it for 11 years. Is this your longest live stream ever? No, I think we had one that went just a little bit longer than this one. We need to end this one. I'm trying to get to the last question. <laughs> um, yeah, please place your order. It'll go out on Monday if I have it in stock. I'm running low on stuff. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to remind you guys again, there's no live stream next weekend. I am traveling to go see my mother for her birthday this week. And then as soon as I, I'm home for like seven hours, and then I jump on a plane, I go to Iowa to speak. So um, this whole week is going to be very full. And if I'm out of something, I will be getting it in while I'm gone. And then I will ship the orders out the following Monday. So, or, or Tuesday, something like that. Let's see. Uh, Tyler says, I keep getting this tiny patch of green hair algae that just keeps coming back. He pulls it off and it keeps coming back. What can I do to make it stop? Get some hermit crabs, get some snails, put them on that spot and keep them on that spot and help to eradicate it. You could also maybe take that one piece of whatever is being infected with algae, lift it out of the water and put some peroxide directly on it. Just drip it in with like a syringe, you know, just drip, 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 drip. Wait five minutes or so, dip it in some salt water in a bucket and then put the rock back in your tank and that should get rid of the last of that algae and you'll have no more problems anymore. Um... Petsotix says, how's it going? <laughs> That's not the kind of question I was asking for. John says, I have dinoflagellates and uh, I'm planning to do a blackout for three days. Do I feed the tank during the blackout? Yes. And all you do is turn on the light in the room so they can see a little bit and feed the fish and then turn the light back off. That's all. I'm not even saying blackout like with trash bags and all that kind of stuff. I've seen people do that. I just feel like just don't run the lights in your tank. Unless the tank is near some direct sunlight, odds are it'll take care of itself. Ah, Kalina. <laughs> Kalina, you shouldn't have been shy. I always tell everyone, come say hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, do you have a website? Yes, I do. I run milasreef.com and I sell products from it. I have a ton of information to educate you so you can be a successful hobbyist. So feel free to read the blogs, read the articles, uh, check out the videos. Um, there's a whole bunch of good information. I've been amassing that information for about 15 years on the website. I'll leave that on the screen for a couple minutes. <laughs> Alex says, break the record. <laughs> What's two plus two? You guys are running out of questions. I love it. Let's see. Um... <laughs> Alex, you're probably not supposed to put that on the web. Unless you live in Denver. Uh, Matthew says, cleaner wrasse or cleaner shrimp? I would say depends what you're trying to accomplish. The cleaner wrasse is um, a really good fish to keep parasites off your fish. It cleans them. The cleaner shrimp, he's going to peck at everything, and he may get on the side of a fish occasionally. I would say the wrasse is more proactive at cleaning a fish. Maybe both would be really cool. I think you might enjoy that. So why don't you give that some thought? All right. Guys, I'm going to wrap this up. We got to, it's gone too long. We're uh, four, uh, how long are we into this thing? Almost two and a half hours. Uh, it's Water Test Saturday. It's really important. Please do test your water. I want you to grab your test kits. Uh, get that thing off my screen. I want you to grab your test kits. I want you to use them. They are not designed to last forever. They're good for one year. You're supposed to use them 52 times. Please use your test kits, measure your water, see what's going on, make adjustments if needed, double check your numbers in case that the numbers have, if you have any doubt about one of them, um, and you know, of course share your numbers online. Come to Club Milo's Reef and tell us what's going on with your tank. We love to see pictures of your tank and answer your questions and see your setup. And I saw somebody's great setup recently and I asked him, please do a full write-up for our club and that way people can check it all out in a big thread because it was a really interesting setup with a lot of really good forethought and I thought you guys would really appreciate it, so be sure you're part of Club Meals Reef as well. And uh, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover. Guys, thanks so much, and I hope you have a great weekend. Bye.